2500 North Capitol Street, Suite 650, Washington, D.C. Our zip code is 20001. Up next, we take you to the U.S. Capitol Building for coverage of a House Rules Committee hearing held on Wednesday to develop the rule to allow for the consideration of the Civil Rights Act of 1991. Each bill that comes to the House floor for a vote must first have a rule which sets ground rules for debate on the measure. The Democrat Civil Rights Bill is aimed at reversing a series of 1989 Supreme Court decisions that increase the burdens of proof on plaintiffs in job discrimination cases. The Bush administration opposes the bill, saying that it will encourage employers to use quotas in hiring. Next, we turn to the Rules Committee hearing chaired by Congressman Joseph Moakley of Massachusetts. Committee and Rules will now come to order. There's been a request for the filming of portions of today's hearings. Without objection, uh, it will be permitted. The portion that you're out of the room. <laughs> Just one big happy family. <laughs> you got to understand it. H.R. 1 from the Committee on Judiciary and Education Labor, the Civil Rights Act of 1991. We're very honored to have the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the Honorable Jack Brooks of Texas, to, uh, to be accompanied by the Honorable Hamilton Fish of New York. Would gentlemen please take your seats? <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm here to ask you to grant a rule for the full consideration of the bill H.R. 1, the Civil Rights Act of 1991. The Committee on the Judiciary, after a full and energetic debate on the bill, ordered it reported by a vote of 24 to 10 on March 19th. The Civil Rights Act of 91 has two primary purposes. The first is to respond to a series of recent Supreme Court decisions by restoring civil rights provisions which were dramatically limited by those decisions. The second is to strengthen existing protections and remedies available under the civil rights law to provide more effective deterrence and adequate compensation for all victims of discrimination. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you know that ever since the President vetoed the Civil Rights Bill last fall, becoming only the third President since the Civil War to take that action, discussions have been going on among of various groups aimed at arriving at a consensus product. As I announced at a press conference last week, these discussions have resulted in the development of substitute language that will resolve a number of major issues involved in the bill. I believe this bipartisan consensus package can win the support of reasonable men and women on all sides of the issue. And because I'm here uh, simply to seek a rule that will include uh, consideration of the Democratic substitute to H.R. 1 as reported, I think it's important to avoid <coughs> a superficial inflammatory discussion on language that should be carefully reviewed by members of the committee and by all members of the House. I'm certain that after careful and deliberate review of the language that I'm offering, uh, it will be abundantly clear that the substitute addresses all the major issues raised in this volatile discussion and debate, rather, and resolves them in a balanced manner. Much of the rhetoric we've heard in preceding months has been the result of either a failure to read the substantive language of the bill or a clear choice by some to misrepresent it. And for this reason, I'm looking forward to a, a substantive discussion of the bill's merits on the floor, and I think such a discussion will work to the benefit of this body in discharging its highest responsibility as elected public officials. Far too much heat and far too little light has been generated in the debate so far. And as one member, I'm determined to change that. 
I would hope that the substitute uh, that a ham fiction I offer, want to offer, will be made in order under the rule, and that the rule would provide ample opportunity for discussion of specific provisions by the members. I expect as well that adequate provision would be made for consideration of any substitute that might be brought forward by the minority, though I have seen none. In approving a rule for this measure, you'll have to strike some kind of balance between the competing approaches to the problem. I know you'll craft a fair and a workable rule that will permit the comprehensive consideration of the relative merits of these proposals. Other than these specific recommendations, I leave it to the wisdom of the Rules Committee to formulate an equitable rule that will permit this controversial yet crucial matter to be fully aired and which will permit the House to work its will. I appreciate the opportunity to testify and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Jack, uh, on the rule itself, how much time would you request? I, uh, I think that on general debate we could probably uh, do with uh, would probably do with about two hours of general debate. It's my understanding that Chairman Ford uh, had planned to be here, but he cannot leave his hearing. And uh, I'd like, uh, with your permission, to submit his statement. Without objection, the entire statement but, of Chairman Ford will appear on the record. And I believe that um, the Chairman Ford is quite willing to let uh, me manage the bill on the floor, and I don't think we'll have to have that convoluted system of having two chairmen handling bill and yielding and dividing the time and and people go get time from you then they go get time from somebody else and, and then you exclude somebody who didn't get any time we just went through that be, last week it's kind of <laughs> kind of convoluted we had we had three chairmen that's right i think that's an undesirable system six people right so i think that uh, mr ford and i can work it out on our side very readily and and if we had two hours, we'd have one hour, which I would handle on my side and would yield to And Ford. how much time on the amendments of the substitutes? On the amendments, I think we can do them in an hour, running, the, running between Mr. Fish and myself. An hour on each amendment? On, on, on one amendment, an hour on the substitute? On the substitute. We don't have any amendments. Oh, I mean, an hour a piece on the substitute? On the substitute, yes, sir. Uh, do we have a Republican substitute? I don't know if they're I think we will have one, yeah. Mr. Sullivan? Mr. Chairman, uh, you, you're talking, uh, seem to be talking about uh, uh, one uh, Democrat substitute and one Republican substitute. Right. I thought I heard the chairman testify that he was going to leave it to the infinite wisdom of this, uh, this committee. Uh, uh, I know uh, we've got about 14 amendments from Republicans, and from my conversations with uh, a number of Democrats, uh, they, they want an open rule. And um, uh, I would, could I just pose the question, uh, are we uh, now talking about a closed rule, or are we talking about an open rule? Uh, you you well, didn't seem to have any be, preference. No, well, I, I thought the amount of time no, would I, be required for a general debate, which would be about two hours, and for the Democratic substitute, I think <coughs> an hour general debate would be adequate. Uh, I don't know what the Republicans, whether they'll have an amendment and, or not. That's another matter. But they might have an hour, too, if we had an hour. I don't know that you'll have an amendment for... Uh, any separate votes on um, uh, cap issues? Uh, we cover the cap in our substitute. I know you do. Mr. Fish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could address the, the issues of uh, the rule <clears throat> first. Uh, and let me in the outset say that I'm delighted to see Mr. Solomon sitting on your right side. This is the first time I've appeared at the Rules Committee since his ascendancy to be the ranking minority member well, of the Committee on Rules. You'd be surprised to see him sitting on my left side, I'll tell you and, that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm delighted to see you there, Jerry. <laughs> I understand that uh, Mr. Hyde, the ranking Republican member of the Subcommittee of Jurisdiction on Judiciary, uh, will be appearing before you and will be seeking an open rule, and, uh, which I support. Uh, the Mr. Uh, Chairman, you might recall a letter dated April 23rd addressed to you, signed by the Republican leader, Mr. Michael, and myself, Mr. Hyde, in which we asked that the amendments that offered by Republicans in the full committee uh, be made in order if the sponsors of those amendments wish to, uh, wish to do so. As regards the um, uh, 
uh, the rule, it, it does seem to me that, uh, and I've discussed this with the chairman, that we have a very, very important matter here. Uh, it's undergone a considerable uh, revision, which I'll be glad to talk about. The, um, it's complex. Uh, it wasn't really finalized until yesterday. And um, I would think that uh, since tomorrow, I understand, is, is devoted to the gen rule and general debate, that the general debate might well be more than two hours to allow for a full explanation of the, uh, the two major provisions. One is the, the uh, Brooks Fish substitute, which is a substitute for the entire H.R. 1, with about eight areas of new language uh, which, uh, it, which reflects the concerns of members of Congress, the business community, uh, and others. So that um, not only do I think we should be generous in general debate, but that I would hope that when we get to consideration of the administration uh, substitute and uh, the Brooks Fish substitute that uh, at least two hours would be given to, uh, to each, to, particularly when you have two committees involved. Uh, it, it narrows down the time for um, Republicans and Democrats on each committee to be, to be heard. Mr. Uh, chairman, as the uh, chairman of the full committee has said, uh, what we're presenting is H.R. 1 as reported by Education, Labor, and by Judiciary. And in our substitute, uh, we have incorporated eight key changes reflecting the concerns of members of Congress and particularly the business community. In particular, these concerns were that the legislation would lead to quotas and that there was a need for a cap. And these have been addressed. I, I do not think and I never have thought that H.R. 1 was a quota bill. However, the new language uh, that we present in our substitute puts this issue to rest uh, by making the use of quotas an unlawful employment practice. Um, I don't know to what extent the committee wishes me to, to go ahead. I, I can show where the eight categories appear in the text of, of the um, amendment, the nature of a substitute that we're offering, if that's the wish of the committee. You can submit your full statement for the record if you want, Mr. Fish. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman. May I also introduce the chairman of the subcommittee who is here for any questions or help that he could render to you or to us, uh, the Honorable Don Edwards from California. Well, Mr. Edwards, do you want to sure. join the panel? Do you want to join the panel at this time? And the uh, committee would be glad to he hear your opening statement if you have one. Uh, I have none. Mr. Chairman, except to say amen to uh, what my colleagues have said, uh, I'd like to point out that with regard to the cap that the subcommittee I chair, the Democrats were unanimous in opposing a cap and we reported the bill without a cap. We, the uh, full Judiciary Committee overwhelmingly rejected uh, Mr. Hyde's amendment to provide a, a cap, and uh, so I think it's only fair that there be an opportunity to handle that matter by some kind of a vote in the, in the full House. So the subcommittee had no cap on it? The subcommittee vigorously rejected a cap this year and last year. The full Judiciary Committee vigorously rejected a cap last year and this year. We did put a cap with the general yield. So it's cap on the bill now. We put it not in the bill as reported by the committee. Oh, okay. In the substitute, we have a cap which follows the cap that was put on by the conference last year and which the House voted for and which many of the people who now question it did vote for when that conference came back to this Congress. And in reality, I voted against it in committee, but I'm, real, I'm a realist. And uh, we're going to have to put one on to pass a bill. And I thought we'd put it in the substitute. And Mr. Fish and I agreed and put it in. Is Mr. Edwards asking for a, uh, an amendment to be made in order to be able to remove the cap? Uh, Mr. Solomon, you, you will have other witnesses that will address that problem. I think I've made my position clear that I am opposed uh, to a cap. Mr. Brooks is opposed to a cap. I, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Edwards just showed how it proceeded through the subcommittee and the full committee and that the substitute uh, doesn't jive with the sub full committee and the, su the subcommittee's action. Am I correct? 
Mr. Derrick. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I understand that Mr. Young is going to have an amendment. Mr. Mr. Young, Mr. Young is going to right to exempt Ward's Cove from the bill, and it's my understanding that uh, that uh, Mr. Michael supports that. I, I wonder if you might have a comment on that, you or Mr. Edwards. Here. I. Uh, what? The, uh, if, if you'd like for someone else down the road, some, some other witness. Briefly, that uh, we have a retroactive provision in the bill, uh, which is a little bit um, <clears throat> stronger than I would have preferred, or not strong enough, really. It says if a, if a case has gone to a final judgment, final, final, then it would not be considered. But, you know, some of these cases have a tendency to drag on with lots of lawyers like us for 10 or 15 years and somebody else files and they go back and they go to the Supreme Court and they waltz around for years and some of these cases are pending for as many as 20 years, which does seem a little inequitable uh, because justice ought to be final. It ought to be rendered rather soon. You can't keep everybody on the hook. Now, if uh, any, any case has uh, meets the test that is now required, which would be uh, uh, substantive and manifest, substantial and manifest relationship to requirements for effective job performance, it may well be that they could meet that test without any problem and be exempt regardless of whether they were final, 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 final or not. This covers pending cases, is that, is that right, Mr. Chairman? What? This covers pending cases? Yeah, it would. Yeah. If they are not, uh, if they don't meet the test, it would preclude the retroactive application in the absence of a finding of manifest injustice under existing federal rules of procedure. Now, if they meet that test, they'll be off the hook. And I think maybe a good many of them can. This is the broadest possible uh, test that we could give them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Solomon. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, while we have uh, these three gentlemen here, you know, I, I think we really, we need to kind of lay our cards out on the table and let's find out what we're all talking about here, um, rather than uh, recessing later on and coming back here and then uh, talking about closed rules or whatever we're going to be talking about. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can't you, uh, would you just uh, enlighten uh, us as to what you think is going to happen with this rule? Because I see Mrs. Schroeder over here, um, and I want to ask Mr. Edwards some questions about uh, this business of, of what we're going to be amending, uh, and uh, whether or not it's going to be the Democrat substitute, which I think you have every right to, to uh, offer the Schroeder amendment to that. I want to see an open rule. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting a little wary now because it seems to me like we may be talking about allowing Mrs. Schroeder to amend the Republican substitute. And that, uh, uh, that's a whole different ballgame. What are we talking about? Are we talking about an open rule or are we talking uh, uh, where we go from here? We're not talking about anything. We're just soliciting well, testimony from the w uh, We don't uh, have any rule drawn up at the present time, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Solomon. We're, uh, we're just trying to get the best... Uh, information we can from the people who have been working the longest and the hardest of the situation. And, and uh, our rule is not uh, crafted at the present time. Well, then, then let me just say to, to my good friend Jack Brooks, and we missed you over at the uh, NATO conference, Jack. Uh, it was a good meeting. Good could've, meeting? Could have used your support there. but uh, My uh, mother-in-law had her 80th birthday, oh and I thought gosh. that was critical. That sure is. <laughs> very very critical for your mother-in-law. <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, it's critical for Jack. It's <laughs> critical for me, too. You ought to understand. <laughs> let me... Uh, let me just say to all of you, I know Don Edwards, I, I served with him <laughs> on the Veterans Affairs Committee for years and years and years, and he is a very, very fair man. Uh, you know, we never had a modified rule of any kind on any kind of civil rights legislation up until just a couple of years ago, and, and you gentlemen have been here longer in this Congress than uh, most people, and you were here when all of the significant civil rights legislation was passed, 
under an open rule where members on both sides of this aisle had the opportunity to, to be heard on these very, very critical issues. And, and there are so many issues involved, uh, whether it deals with race norming or quotas or uh, caps. Uh, don't you think that, that the members of this House, the Republicans and Democrats alike, deserve to be heard on the floor? Uh, to offer their amendments and let's let's debate this issue and let's let the American people hear what it's all about rather than what I feel is coming in some kind of a restrictive rule where your members on the Democrat side are going to be gagged and certainly ours are on our side of the aisle too. Wouldn't you support an open rule like Mr. Fish? Well, Mr. Solomon, I think you ought to have a <clears throat> rule that uh, is a little more reasonable. I don't think we ought to spend a week and a half on this. I believe that uh, the situation has changed a lot from it was in 64 when I voted for this civil rights proposal. Uh, people now understand it pretty well. We've, we've been in the process for 25 years. Uh, it's pretty well understood. Uh, the industries in this country uh, have lived with it very well. They don't want to have harassment in their workplaces. Most of the thinking and reasonable people in the country realize that we've got to have uh, some adjustments to civil rights. We've got to continue this same effort to give everybody protection, uh, including my wife and my two daughters, too, under harassment provisions. But I don't think we have quite the same problem that we did have. You just, if you think that this is hot, this is cool compared to 64 very cool. They were very, very uh, hard feelings going around at that time. There was a lot of division and a lot of rhetoric, and it was a very a difficult time for members. It was a fascinating time if you're from the Deep South like me and voting for it. Oh, Jack, you know, I have the deepest respect for both of you, but, you know, we just uh, finished last week debating the defense authorization bill where we had some uh, 80 amendments offered. Uh, we made an order about 48 of those amendments. Uh, there was a good, clear debate on all the significant issues. And we finished that bill in less than two days. Now, here is an issue which in, I think in everybody's mind here is every bit as, Im as important as the defense of our country. And it's a civil rights for people. Uh, you know, uh, uh, our American foreign policy is, is the sovereignty of all nations and human rights for all people. And we're talking about human rights and civil rights for our people here in this country. If you think there's going to be something hot, you put out a closed rule on this, and that we are going to do everything in our power to defeat the previous question, to defeat the rule, to defeat the bill. Well, oh, that doesn't sound like you, Solomon. Well, a reasonable man like you. But why can't we have... Uh, limited debate on these 14 uh, amendments from the Democrats and the Republicans. Limit the time so we can we can at least have their day in court for Mr. Hyde, uh, for all of the members, for Mr. Stenholm. Uh, you know, why why for a substitute? They put everything they want in their substitute. We put what we thought was good in our Mr. Fish and I tried to craft it to meet most all of the objections that anybody has raised. Well, I made in my the most point on objective that. way. I made my point on that. Let's just talk about the, uh, the proposed Schroeder amendments coming down the road. Um, is it your intention that uh, you would support allowing her to, to amend your Democrat substitute uh, uh, because that's the way it came out of committee to correct it, but not to amend the Republican substitute? It, no, I don't. That's your right. business. So you, so you, you just want her to amend yours. Uh, your, your, your no, 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 no. My judgment is that um, my judgment after thinking about it, after fighting caps in the subcommittee with Mr. Edwards, after defeating the cap in the General Judiciary Committee, I then realized that if we're going to pass a bill, we've got to have a cap on it, as we did in the conference last year. And so I put a cap in my substitute. Mr. Fish and I have the same cap in the substitute, in the Brooks Fish substitute, that was in the conference of last year. And we think that is the way it must go and will go. And to eliminate a lot of palaver and controversy and argument, I put it in. Now, if they want to continue that argument on the floor and you want to let them do that, that's your choice and theirs. I don't think it's particularly good management 
of the time of the House. Since in the final analysis, I would bet an awful lot of my own money that there will not be a bill without a cap on it. One last question, because I see Mr. Ford just came in. Uh, we were talking about the allocation of, uh, of time, and uh, as we did on the defense authorization bill, uh, it's important that the, that the proponents and opponents of the two major committees uh, certainly have equal time out there. And uh, what, is, what is your feeling on, that, uh, on the division of time with whatever time we decide we're going to give to the... Uh, well, I'm asking you and them, Mr. Chairman. You're not asking Mr. Ford. He's not at the table. No. Well, oh. and, uh, but he, they're in uh, right. consultation right. back there, and uh, we might as well uh, get his input. Well, I think that uh, it's already Mr. Brooks said that he'd like two hours of general debate, one hour on the substitute, and uh, Mr. Fish, I think, asked for four hours, didn't you? Four and two, yes. Four and two. Well, what I'm saying is if it is four or two, does Mr. Hyde, for instance, who would probably be uh, end up on the opposing side, uh, does he uh, have equal time to manage with, with the proponent of the bill? Mr. Hyde will get exactly the same time on his substitute as the Democrat, uh, they do on the Democratic side. Well, we haven't answered the question, uh, and I think uh, when we... divide the time, the members, when you assign the time to me, I divide my time and try and give half of it to the people that are against it and half of them that are for it. And I assume, and normally, when Hamilton Fish is handling the other side, he takes half of it for the proponents and half for the opponents. And we've always have done this traditionally in Congress for sure. 40 years. Well, I think when we recess here, when we finish hearing the testimony, perhaps we really ought to have some consultation on, uh, between the speaker and the Republican leader on just how, with, with you people, on how we end up dividing up the time. I think that's very important. I would yield. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Derrick uh, asked our view about uh, in a, in a proposed amendment that would remove consideration of Ward's Cove Packing Company versus Antonio from the purview. Uh, this is quite an extraordinary request in as much as both the President's uh, bill and the um, Brooks Fish Substitute deals with this issue uh, in exactly the same way. Uh, we go, uh, I'm talking now about the issue of the burden of proof that uh, in which Ward's Cove reversed the, the, the present or the law previous to that and we think and the President thinks it's unreasonable to require that individuals denied employment opportunities to disprove a business justification, a matter solely within the knowledge of the, of the employer. And so uh, both uh, the President's bill and our substitute uh, overrules the treatment of business necessity as a defense in, in Ward's Cove. Um, I point that out because even though we go beyond that and, and treat the other half of the Ward's Cove decision in the substitute um, it certainly is a key measure, a key decision of the Supreme Court that that uh, should be treated in, in all, all the various pieces of legislation. So you would not support the exempting? Absolutely not. Thank you very much. Mr. Bielinson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just, just a couple of quick questions, if I might. We're asking for general debate, of course, for two hours or however much. And then to make an order, two substitutes, one, one by yourself, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Fish together and another one by Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde. With respect to the first substitute, as I understand it, it's the chairman's suggestion that it, that it not be subject to amendment. Is that sort of correct, or am I putting words in your mouth? That would be my suggestion, But yes. Mr. Hyde, Mr. your we friend over here. everything in it but the kitchen sink I understand. Now. Wouldn't be subject to the short amendment? But your, your friend over here, Mr. Fish, on the other hand, although he's supporting you with respect to that substitute, uh, wouldn't mind it being subject to amendment. Is that correct, Ham? That's correct. On the other side, we've got Mr. Hyde's Republican substitute, or Mr. Hyde's substitute. I guess it's bipartisan. It may be bipartisan. And with respect to that, is the, is the suggestion by Mr. Hyde and his friends that that be open and subject to amendment? Do I we think know? we'll probably hear, we'll hear from I Mr. Hyde on that. Maybe somebody could nod, or maybe Mr. Solomon knows the answer. Well, I would just <laughs> certainly, uh, if, if, if uh, the Democrat substitute is not going to be open for amendment, then the Republican substitute is not going to be open for amendment. Oh, okay. They're going to be treated equally. Whatever. All right, fine. That's yeah. Fair enough. Um, one, and just one further question, if I may. I think to our friend again, Mr. Solomon, only because when I am seeking information. I think you, you mentioned, Jerry, that there might be as many as 12 or 15 amendments that some of your folks would like to, like to have made in order, and ours, whatever, whomever. Do you have any idea, and I, I do ask this out of ignorance, do you have any idea what they, what they pertain to, how important they are, they are? I mean, I'm just, I'm just reaching here. 
Uh, I have no idea in the world what we're going to come up with. I don't think any of us do at this point. But sure. are, there, are there, for example, two or three that are of particular importance that it might yeah. satisfy people if just those few were made in order? Or do you really need a, a fully the, open there's, bill? There's the issue of Ward's Cove. There's the issue of uh, eliminating compensatory and uh, punitive damages. Uh -huh. Uh, there's the limit on the uh, job harassments with, with the caps. Uh, there's the uh, uh, prohibition on race norming. Uh, those are maybe the four issues, but Mr. Hyde can probably answer your question better when he comes up here to testify. Okay. He would have the priorities in, in an I, order of priority. I take it, am I correct in assuming, I may not be, that some of the amendments that, that our friend over here from New York would like to make in order are in, in fact or will be included in Mr. Hyde's substitute Anyway, so if that were to be adopted, those amendments would also be adopted, or is that not correct assumption? Does anybody? Not necessarily. Okay. Tony, would, would you yield a moment? Of course. Those four are covered in the Brooks Fish yeah. Amendment. Right. Uh, we think we cover those four issues. Uh, but but, but uh, they want to uncover them. There may be some mind. difference in just the exact language of how they want right. them covered. You know, right. You've got to would, cover them just the way they want them covered, or they don't think it's covered. Would the gentleman in California yield? Of course. Uh, we, uh, we received the Democrat substitute, uh, or the Brooks Fish substitute, at 7.30 last night. I think Alan Coffey right. from the uh, Minority Council did. Uh, we were given a copy of it, the Rules Committee, about 8.30 last night. And uh, from When uh, are we going to get a copy of yours? Uh, what, well, we, we just got yours to read it. Uh, and we're going oh, to discuss got to that in a few minutes. It. All right, all right. But, uh, but, it, but, but it may be that, that uh, your folks won't need all their amendments. I mean, it may be that the, that the Brooks Fish substitute is going to take care of some of their problems. Well, a, according to my conversations with Mr. Hyde and with Mr. Michael right. and others, <laughs> it does not deal with those subjects at all. It's, uh, it clouds the issue, and our amendments would still be need, need to be made in order. That's how, how we feel about <laughs> it. And okay. we feel very strongly about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Brooks and Mr. Fish and my fellow California, Mr. Edwards, all know that I hold them in extraordinarily high regard. But I have to say that it was interesting commentary to see the distinguished ranking member of the Rules Committee arguing to the chairman of the Judiciary Committee in behalf of an open rule. And I find it as a fascinating commentary on the rights of the minority here as we begin to face the question of a, of a civil rights bill. And I, I, too, would join with Mr. Solomon in vigorously arguing in behalf of an open rule on this issue. Uh, as was said uh, by Mr. Solomon, we have seen up until the past couple of years open rules on this. And Chairman Brooks, you're absolutely right. The debate may not be as heated as it was in 1964, but I think some very important questions remain today. And Mr. Fish said that he doesn't believe this is a quota bill. There are many of us who are concerned about the prospect of the imposition of quotas. Henry Hyde has talked about the uh, the uh, bottle of Muscatel with the Cordon Bleu label on it, and I'm sure we'll be hearing about that in just a few minutes. The, uh, the question of retroactivity is something that is of concern, the burden of proof question, and I think these are issues which clearly could make this an extraordinarily heated debate. And uh, so I see that I was not here in 1964, Mr. Chairman, you... No, no, you didn't do that. <laughs> But, but we do hope in, uh, in the Brooks Fish substitute to explain those issues to you uh, in the substitute uh, on the floor and in the general debate without much difficulty, really. Well, when, when I heard, heard you uh, raise the question of some, when I heard you raise the question of, um, you know, the fact that this will not be nearly as heated or this is certainly a much cooler time than it was in 1964. Uh, somebody handed me a, an excerpt from a column from one of the black leaders who wrote uh, just a little over two months ago in the Washington Post, William Raspberry. He wrote, the problems most critically affecting black America are the joblessness and despair of our young people, the academic indifference of our children, the disillusion of our families, the destruction by crime and drug trafficking of our neighborhoods, the economic marginality of our people, and the Civil Rights Act of 1991 won't do a blessed thing about these problems. And when you have someone as respected as William Raspberry making statements like that, it, it leads me to believe that maybe this will be rather controversial and pretty heated. And that's why I hope that we'll be able to move ahead and give every one of our members... I believe he'd vote for it, though, Dwyer. Excuse me? <laughs> I believe he'd vote for it. Yeah. Well, Bob just reminded me to read the next sentence here. He said, H.R. 1 threatens to divide America along racial lines just when white America stands ready to support racial programs and policies it believes to be fair. 
<coughs> it calls for ending production of the old model of civil rights legislation exemplified by the Kennedy Bill and replacing it with a new model whose chief marketing points would be its orientation towards solutions as opposed to blame assignment and its unambiguous fairness. The only point I'm making, Mr. Chairman, is I think that we need to have every member who wants to have the right to offer an amendment to have the chance to do that, and I hope very much that we'll be able to. Finished, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wheat, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have any questions, but if, if you will allow me to take just a couple of moments for a couple of statements, I find this a, a fascinating debate that we are having where the uh, the party that has traditionally led the opposition to civil rights, civil rights bills in, in this body is uh, claiming it as a matter of uh, a civil right that the bill should be discussed under a completely open rule. Now, I, I want to congratulate the uh, chairman of the committee, the, subcomm the subcommittee chairman and the ranking member for having taken a very, very difficult subject technically, uh, which we all recognized was a vital subject for this Congress to consider, and that's why it was made H.R. 1 and having put it together in, in, a, in a very complicated bill. What they are attempting to do is to reinterpret five Supreme Court decisions, a matter of almost unimaginable complexity. And they have had the support of all, uh, a number of legal experts, all of the members of the committee, and they have fashioned what I believe is a, is a fair bill to bring out to the floor of the House of Representatives. To then suggest that a bill of this complexity should be rewritten on the floor uh, by every member of Congress is, I think, an, an insult to the process that we have undergone so far. Uh, that would be giving, I believe, an unf unfair procedural advantage uh, to the opponents of this bill to attempt to destroy the bill procedurally <laughs> as opposed to making a philosophical decision, which I hope they can live with, uh, merely to be opposed to, to the Civil Rights Bill. Now, I note with, uh, I note with some pleasure that there seems to be an indication that we're going to be willing to listen to civil rights leaders on this subject, and I, I hope that that willingness will extend to the people who have been elected to this body who represent a, a great uh, portion of black America, as well as to the civil rights leaders who have written the columns on either side of this issue to this point in time. Thank you. Mr. McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I could make statements as well, but uh, with the Chairman's time, I will we'll wait for only questions, and I have none at this time. Mr. Gordon. I just want to thank the panel for the long, tedious hours they put into uh, crafting uh, this very technical and, and fair bill. I thank you for your, for your efforts, and I look forward to uh, voting for the bill when it reaches the floor. Ms. Slaughter, no questions. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Jack, uh, we may call upon you and Mr. Fish at a later time we'll as this thing progresses. We'll be available at any time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ham. Yeah. Oh, he's gone out. We'll just. The uh, next witness is the Honorable Patricia Schroeder of Colorado, uh, who will be joined by Ms. Maxine Walters, uh, Waters of uh, California. Also, I'm sorry, also on the panel will be uh, the Honorable Mary Rose Oka, the Honorable Barbara Kennelly, and the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, will somebody get some chairs? <laughs> so why don't you go? Pull a chair up. Why don't you pull one of those chairs over? That's it. Ms. Schroeder. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for letting me be here. I would ask unanimous consent to put 
both Congresswoman Okar and Congresswoman Mink's statements in the record. They Without were objection, able to be Without objection, Congresswoman Okar and Congresswoman Mink's entire statements will appear in the record. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to put mine in the record and summarize if that's Without all right. Without objection, the entire statement of the gentlelady from Colorado will appear in the record. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to thank all the committees that worked so hard on this. Being on the Judiciary Committee, I know how technical and how difficult this whole area has been. I want to thank them for working on this because I think it's so terribly important. I have come to respectfully request that we do allow one amendment, and that is the one dealing with the caps, the caps on punitive damages. I find that this goes right to the fairness issue. This goes right to what civil rights is all about. Here is the issue in a nutshell, as succinctly as I can say it. If we allow caps to go in, which, by the way, neither the Judiciary Committee or the Education and Labor Committee did either time, last year or this year, um, it was put in, yes, on a very late hour one night with a conference and all of that, but we've not had hearings on it, we've not debated it, because I think it's almost impossible um, to argue for the caps as they come out in this bill uh, and how they would be applied. The reason, I think, is because most people think the caps would apply to everybody. It would apply to everyone in the bill, however, um, historically there is another statute that would allow damages that would not be capped for people of different religious or ethnic and racial minorities. That means, according to the law, Jews have been included in that, Muslims have been included in that, um, obviously African Americans have been included that and that and so forth. So what does it mean? It means if you have a disabled veteran and there is malicious intent against them, we're talking about intentional discrimination under Title VII. If you have malicious intent, that person's damages are going to be capped. However, if they were not only a disabled veteran but belonged to one of the ethnic or racial minorities, their, their things would not be capped. If you had discrimination against a Catholic, those damages would be capped. If you had discrimination against someone of Jewish or Muslim faith, they would not be capped. Obviously, the women have talked a lot about this, because if you are a white woman and you are subject to sexual harassment, your damages would be capped. If you are of, of subject to sexual harassment but of a ethnic or minority group, no, they would not be capped. Now, I just think this goes right to the core of what civil rights are about. We're talking about treating people equally. And if you don't have equal remedies, you don't have equal treatment. You don't have equal rights. So I understand why the business community has pushed for this, but I think it would be incredible not to push forward and at least allow those of us who are very concerned about it to have an amendment to take it out since all the committees have not put it in. There's not been hearings on this. No one really wants to come and defend it. Let me just make several points. First of all, let me emphasize one more time that this must be discrimination with malice or reckless and callous indifference. I mean, this is really the heavy intentional type. That's what we're talking about. Many have said the reason we must have a cap is lawyers will reap a bonanza. Well, let me tell you, that is just absolutely not true. There were 600 Section 1981 cases filed in the last 10 years that went all the way through. 600. Now these are the ones without a cap for racial and ethnic minority. Of those, only three cases had damages of more than $100,000. So I don't see how any lawyer is going to hang up a shingle and suddenly make a fortune on this. That doesn't make any sense at all. Basically, I think it's just this two-tiered damage system uh, goes right at everything we stand for. When we had the Fair Housing Act up here, no one was talking about capping, limiting damages. I can't believe we're not going to limit, we're going to limit damages at work, but not at home. 
The discrimination at home, there's no cap on, but at work we put cap on for different and certain people. So I, I guess what I'm saying is I really hope that we will have a chance to at least debate this on the floor um, and that we will have a chance to take this out. And with that, I've used more than enough time and I'd like to yield to uh, my distinguished colleague over here from Connecticut, if I may, at this point, Congresswoman Connelly. Chairman Moakley, and thank you for allowing me to appear before this committee, and thank you other members. And I ask that my entire statement be uh, put into the record. Without objection, the general lady is I, too, uh, come before this committee uh, to ask that an amendment to strike provisions that caps punitive damages for Title VII discrimination cases uh, be allowed for all substitutes to H.R. 1. I feel to pass a civil rights bill that caps punitive damages Caps punitive damages, especially to a very large group, women, is really a step back. It means that we are receding in our commitment to equal opportunity, equal job opportunity to all Americans. I feel that caps constitute very bad policy. I also feel that caps codify inequity. I also feel that caps validate specious arguments. And then I think that caps deflate the value of punitive damages. In my statement, goes into all the reasons that I feel this way. But let, just, uh, let me just take some time to ask the Rules Committee to think about exactly what we are doing here. It's a short history. Uh, as uh, Congresswoman Schroeder said, last year the committees came out with no caps. Caps were not in the judiciary proposal or the yet or labor proposal. We had trouble uh, thinking about the bill not only passing, but there was a question about whether the President of the United States would sign the bill. And so caps were introduced in conference. As we well know, the President vetoed the bill. This year, the same Judiciary Committee, the same Ed and Labor Committee, came out with a bill with no caps on punitive damages. We began to take a whip count. We began to talk to each other. We began to see where the votes were. And all of a sudden, it was suggested that to make the bill veto-proof, we introduce caps. And therefore, they were introduced into the substitute to H.R. 1. I really feel that this is a very important step that we should not take at this time. And I feel that because it is, and I could go on, in fact, we give speeches about it all the time. We women are half the population of the United States of America. We women have to work for many reasons, to help pay the mortgage, to educate our children. Many of us want to work. Many of us are very fortunate to have educations that give us very good jobs. And we're in that workforce I believe right now over 50 percent. And to send out a message, the Congress of the United States, to send out a message to the women of the United States that you're different, that you're a subgroup, that you aren't with everybody else going before a jury and he hearing your, having your case heard and then subjecting yourself to that jury. We women have no thoughts even that we're ever going to dominate the workforce. But at the same time, we women do not want to be subordinate in that same workforce. I know about the Congress. I know how we have to compromise, we have to negotiate to get a majority of the votes. I understand that. And in some cases, many times often, I go along with that. But we're talking about a very basic right of Americans today. And I would urge the committee to grant this uh, amendment to strike these caps. I think down the line, it's going to be very important to this country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Maxine Waters. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would like to thank you and the members of this committee uh, for uh, allowing us to be here today to share our thoughts with you about this most important piece of legislation. Um, I, as a black woman, um, feel is extremely important for me to be here today to express my opinion about this area of the bill as it relates to cap, um, uh, caps because as a black woman who has fought for civil rights uh, all of my life, I do not intend to try and get something for me or my people that is not available to all people. Similar to the arguments that are made about quotas, those people who say they do not want to see favoritism 
for any one sector of our society must understand that they cannot support favoritism for any se uh, sector of our society in any way. To talk about capping damages for women would set women aside and apart from civil rights legislation in a serious way. To say that somehow it is all right for anybody to be uh, compensated for damages fully after they go through the court process and the courts decide the extent of that damage should be that which is available to everybody. It is uncomprehensible to think about blacks or Jews or uh, religious uh, organizations or anybody having that available to them and women not having the courts available to them to discuss the extent of their damages and compensate them, compensate them based on the court's decision. In addition to that, Mr. Chairman, let me just say, I was not here for the last uh, debate. And I know what is being represented about caps having been in that bill. But clearly, I am here at this point in time where two committees of this House <clears throat> have reported out legislation that had no caps on damages for women. To get to this point and not allow even uh, the opportunity for an amendment that would remove uh, the caps that, that's in the substitute, substitute legislation would simply be unfair. I would ask you to give serious consideration to what Mr. Brooks has said, at least one portion of his testimony, where he talked about what he wants for his wife and what he wants for his daughter. He wants equal opportunity. He wants to make sure that their civil rights are, are protected. If that is to be done, then we must look at this bill in a comprehensive way, and we mu must not talk about simply um, the civil rights bill that would overrule the cases of the Supreme Court that effectively deny civil rights, but they will talk about full civil rights for everybody, full civil rights for minorities, full civil rights for women. And the only way we can have full civil rights for women as it relates to this legislation is to ensure that we do not treat them in a separate and unfair manner and uh, say that the damages for women must be capped in some way that we have not seen before. I fought against it uh, all my life. Uh, again, in the California State Legislature, I was opposed to caps on damages for anybody. I believe that's in the purview of the courts, and the courts should have a right to discuss and uh, make those decisions. And I would ask uh, this committee to rule um, in a way that would allow this amendment to be taken up. Thank you very much. Ms. Noah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to offer a uh, few words of testimony. I, I, I ask for your indulgence as I try to lay out what I believe are serious constitutional questions raised by the uh, limitation, the pro proposed limitation on damages. I would like to testify in favor of a rule to move an invidious and unconstitutional limitation on damages but otherwise in support of uh, a, the majority substitute. I uh, offer this testimony, and offering this testimony, I bring to bear long professional experience as a lawyer who has both taught and specialized in, in employment discrimination, labor, and constitutional law, and as a former chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. This experience is useful in assessing whether damage limitations that would effectively apply only to women, religious groups, and disabled people are necessary or fair. I submit that damage limitations are neither, and that as a result, a limit on damages is also unconstitutional. The damage limitation issue in this legislation has been couched in fairness terms that should have been dispositive, especially in the context of a bill designed to compel workforce fairness. There simply can be no principled rationale for dissimilar treatment of individuals who have experienced intentional discrimination. How can it be argued that a Catholic or a woman who can prove damage should be limited or disallowed while a black person or a pole harmed in the same way could collect? The problem for the Congress, however, goes well beyond generic fairness. I believe that the damage limitation is a violation of both the equal protection 
and the due process clauses of the 14th Amendment and therefore is unconstitutional on its face, at least as applied to women and religious groups, and that there is a First Amendment violation when Congress picks out religion for invidious treatment. When cap damages have been litigated, several state courts have found them to be a violation of due process in denying compensation for proven harm. Beyond this 14th Amendment due process issue, there is a serious equal protection problem. The Supreme Court has settled the question of classification on the basis of gender and religion. The use of a religious classification cannot survive the strict scrutiny that is required for both religious and racial classifications. Moreover, a gender classification will trigger heightened judicial scrutiny compelling the government to demonstrate an important governmental interest. No such interest could possibly be shown here. The governmental interest flows in the opposite direction, in deterring discrimination. The Congress violates the Constitution it is sworn to uphold if it chooses race, sex or religion for limited damages while allowing damages uh, for other violations or harms. The religion-based limitation is also a First Amendment violation in my view because it constitutes state intervention to deprive a victim of compensation based on her religion. Finally, any attempt to avoid Seventh Amendment jury trial requirements by styling the relief as equitable or as fines of some as yet unheard of sort is a transparent sham uh, and cannot survive a constitutional test. I ask this committee, therefore, to permit a rule striking any and all damage limitation provisions. This Congress should not be put in the position of knowingly passing patently unconstitutional legislation. <laughs> Finally, the majority substitute deserves a rule for the careful and balanced way that it successfully resolves some of the most difficult issues in the law. The Congress is faced with a particularly dif difficult task to write legislation that is sufficiently remedial to discourage and remove job discrimination against those who have experienced it with fairness to those who have not. For example, the absolute bar against quotas and race norming on the one hand and the, uh, and the return close to the burden of proof which has successfully revised employment practices in this country on the other accomplish this purpose. The overriding purpose of a job discrimination law is to reform unfair practices and to correct for historic discrimination so that the competition of the marketplace can be fairly brought to the workplace. As a past chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and as a black woman, I assure you I would have preferred stronger legislation. But I and those who agree with me have accepted many compromises in order to accommodate the many interests involved and barring changes in language I have not yet seen are prepared to live with the majority substitute. I urge a rule for that substitute and for a provision that would strike what I believe is both an unfair and an unconstitutional limitation on damages. Thank you, Ms. Uh, you are raised some interesting questions. I see we have uh, two distinguished uh, legal scholars, professors in the room, uh, and uh, I guess we'll hear from the other one in a few minutes. How much time do you, uh, uh, would you like on your amendment? Thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. We would like an hour, and we would like the amended amendment directed to any substitute that has caps in it. We feel that would be time-saving. We would prefer the time um, so we could air this debate that we think is so important and goes right to the core of what we feel civil rights is about. Um, therefore, if we could have an amendment in order to any substitute that's out there that has caps in it, um, we would uh, like to save the time by making one available to all, but then spend the time, the hour, discussing this issue that we think is But so you think critical. your total debate time of an hour, regardless of how many uh, would be Substitutes it applies to. Would be sufficient. Well, we'd like more, Mr. Well, Chairman, uh, but we were afraid know. to ask for more well, because we well, figured uh, if they were doing two hours have, on this. You have system. nothing to fear from the rules committee. <laughs> well, then we'll take four, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, thank all you. of you, for your testimony. Let me ask one question. Of course, you know, this, this bill is probably the most negotiated bill we've had around here lately. And let me give you a, a hypothetical, if I may. I'll probably support your amendment, and I agree with what everything that you said. Suppose your amendment passes and it becomes a part of the bill, 
And because of that, uh, we lose enough votes that we aren't able to override a veto. I mean, do you think that you that you uh, that what you've done has been justified? I mean, yes. you're taking the purest. In other words, you don't want a civil rights bill unless you have it this way. Well, Mr. Chairman, this is still just Act One, as you well know. We do not know what the Senate is going to come up what with. What about all those acts that we've been having uh, that led up to this? Those don't, don't well, count. And, and, and we don't know. Maybe the President would come back. As you know, last time many ended up having to vote for this because we were told that the President would sign it if we agreed to be second class. Well, we bit our tongue and we agreed to be second class and we voted for it and he didn't sign it. So we didn't get one last time and it was in. So we're saying at this time, give us a chance to have one that it's not in. Um, we really felt we were the team players and, and did it last time. And that uh, I think most people, when they understand the cap issue, um, will come around to, to, under, to seeing it. I think they think there's a cap on all damages. I think they think the business community will then say, oh, this is fine. And I think when they find out really what this amendment is about or what the cap limitation is about, I think you'll find that that won't be the reason members vote for it. Um, Do you think that includes the occupant uh, uh, of Pennsylvania Avenue, the president? Mr. Derrick, may I respond to that? Yes. Uh, Mr. Derrick, um, his honor, uh, Mr. Brooks, of the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, spoke about how hot things were back in 1964, and I think we all agree with that. And that was an argument that had been abroad in the, in the land and was fully understood, and, and people felt very strongly one way or the other. We're facing a situation uh, that we're talking about today that results because, unfortunately, uh, it's not 1964, and uh, it, it's not a question of all people being equal in the eyes of the Lord. We've just got ourselves involved in inc incredible legalisms here in this bill. And yet, what you have to understand is that half the population of the United States is women, who are we are about to cap. One, two, three, four, Unfortunately, half the Congress is not women. Only 29 of us are <coughs> women. This issue is not abroad in the land, and it's not exactly the biggest issue in the House at the moment. And I feel very strongly that if we women, even though there be only 29 of us, did not bring this issue forth today and e explain to the Rules Committee how important it is, I don't think there'd be any reason why there even should be 29 of us here. It's a very serious issue when you're talking about equal opportunity. I don't doubt that uh, whatsoever. And I think your arguments have been very eloquent. My uh, question went to the practical politics of the thing. Thank you very much. Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Let me just say to my good friends, Mrs. Schroeder, Mrs. Keneally, Mrs. Waters, and Mrs. Norton, I support your right to let you offer your amendment and make your argument that uh, women should be treated like everybody else. And I hope you get your opportunity. And I'm going to support you. I also am going to support Mr. Grandy, who is sitting behind you for his right to offer an amendment that also seeks to treat women just like everybody else by capping everybody, capping race, color, sex, religion, <coughs> national origin. Uh, don't you think that because of the significance of what you want to do, and I agree with you, I think, I think you, it really ought to be debated more than one hour. Don't you think that Mr. Grandy ought to have his day in court as well, that Mr. Hyde, Mr. Moorhead, Mr. McCollum, Mr. Stenholm, Mr. Fowell, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Young, Mr. Rhodes, Mr. Grandy, and Mr. Gunderson ought to have their chance just like you to make the issues out there? Pat, you serve on the Armed Services Committee, and you had a lot to do with the negotiations of the rule, which allowed us to take that whole uh, important issue, which is one-third of the entire federal budget, and to finish that in two days and deal with 48 amendments on things like the B-2 and SDI and all of these uh, burden sharing, which I represented you over in NATO over the weekend, uh, making your point over there. It's tough, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Don't you think we ought to have an open rule and limit the amendments, the debates on these amendments, to a period of time, an hour for you, an hour for Mr. Hyde? Uh, let me isn't say, that fair? Uh, let me say, as a lawyer, and having sat on the Judiciary Committee, we're talking about some incredibly technical language here. 
as you know, words don't mean what real people think they might mean when you get into the whole legal trappings. So I would be a little apprehensive about letting everybody play with it, because I think it might take the courts another 50 years to figure out what in the world went on. Now, I think allowing amendments for broad debate and for crying out loud determining whether half America's population is going to be treated equal, we ought to be able to have that debate. And we ought to have rules of th that would allow amendments of that magnitude. But if everybody wants to come in and uh, play lawyer for a day, it's almost like when uh, Congresswoman Kennelly and, and the groups from Ways and Means bring the tax bill up. As you know, it can be very technical and very difficult, and so we tend to have a, a little more limited rule. But because this is really dealing with some Supreme Court decisions that came down in the 80s, and because the language is very technical, I, I think the Rules Committee has a more difficult job than normal. I tend to normally vote for open rules, as you know. But this is one where I would say, you know, you can look at the broad principles, and, the, and, and this certainly, I think, is one of the broadest in the whole area of civil rights. But uh, if you're going to allow people to start rewriting all the Supreme Court decisions, we could really create a, a tremendous jobs program for judges and lawyers, and I don't know that that's our goal. Well, I respect your point of view. I, I really do resent a little bit uh, the fact that you don't think that I and other members like me who are non-lawyers, who have been writing laws for 25 years in the state legislatures mm -hmm. and in the federal Congress, uh, that we don't have the, the knowledge to deal with such a thing on the floor. And I know you do support open rules and, uh, and the right for the House to work its will. It just seems to me we ought to be doing that. But well, I appreciate I, your point of view. If and we passed the law saying lawyers had to speak <laughs> as they wrote or whatever, we might be better off. But you know what I mean mm -hmm. about the technicality yes. of these cases. Mr. Hyde disagrees with you, and uh, he is a legal he scholar. He usually does. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him speak for himself. Thank you very much. That's, what, that's why there's two sides to every debate. <laughs> I I Mr. Billingson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say that, that I have found the, the testimony by our, by our women colleagues to be utterly compelling, and I hope and trust that we will make their, their amendment in order. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Mr. Sweet. Ms. Slaughter. I do want to say something, Mr. Chairman. First, I welcome my sisters here. They, Tony Billington is right, the presentation they made is excellent. As a woman member of Congress, uh, I am protected for equal pay as all of you, y'all, do the same under the Constitution as elected official. For most of the women in the United States of America, that is not the case. The Constitution does not recognize us as being entitled to equal rights. Uh, and in the workforce, we are still underpaid. We do not yet have pay equity. The personal thing that rankles me is the title of the bill. If it were not called the Women's Equity Bill, I mean, that really is asking us to accept salt and open wounds. Um, I would very much like to see the issues addressed all across the board as it pertains to, to the half of the population that is under-recognized. And uh, I look forward to the debate on, on this amendment. And I think uh, it should be quite interesting. And it is very difficult for all of us who have to carry the battle for the other women in the United States to try to explain to them that we don't have equal rights, we don't have equal pay, and now our civil rights are in question. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very much. The Honorable Henry Hyde of Illinois. <laughs> Henry, do you want to be joined by anybody or? I don't care. Whoever would like to, whoever has the courage to sit next to me. Uh, I do, Henry. Who would be to the right of you, Henry? <laughs> don't worry, I'm behind you. All right. All right, whatever. Thank you. I shall hurry. I have I have more to say than I really would care to, but it's very important if you. Well, we can you. put your entire statement on the record, as you all know. All right, I will go fast. Uh, shall I? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, I appreciate this opportunity to appear before the Committee on Rules regarding the proposed Civil Rights Act 
of 1991. I'm here in my capacity as ranking Republican member of the Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights of the House Judiciary Committee and also as chairman of the Republican Leadership Task Force on Civil Rights. H.R. 1 and its substitute raises important and fundamental questions about federal civil rights law as it applies in the workplace. It deals with issues that will touch the lives of every American. Because of that, this legislation deserves to be completely and carefully analyzed by the full membership of the House of Representatives. Not too many years ago, when the House considered civil rights legislation, those measures always came to the House floor under an open rule. This was true, for example, of the Civil Rights Act of 57 and the landmark Civil Rights Act of 64. The 64 Act contained Title VII, which established equal employment opportunity as our national policy. Similarly, open rules were granted when the House considered the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Education Amendments of 72, Title IX, the Age Discrimination Act of 75, the Voting Rights Act Amendments of 81, and the Fair Housing Act of 88. Remarkable how the legislators back then were capable, though not all lawyers, of amending that legislation, but somehow today there has been a diminishment of legal skill and legislative skill if the gentle ladies who preceded us who found only one amendment worthy of consideration uh, are, to be, are to be believed. Now, if those landmark civil rights laws could survive the rough and tumble of an unrestricted legislative amendment process, the same ought to hold true for the Civil Rights Act of 1991. An open rule is a recognition that every member of this House has a legitimate and rightful role to play in shaping the eventual end product. Mr. Chairman, there's no area of the law that I can conceive of where it seems more appropriate to recognize this ideal than with the consideration of a civil rights bill. Civil rights is about guaranteeing legal rights for all Americans. It's about fairness, equal opportunity, and openness. It's my hope that these same principles will be applied in connection with the rule that will govern consideration of this important legislation itself. As to the bill, my comments will be directed both at the bill reported by the two standing committees and insofar as possible, the alternative proposal uh, that, we've, that was delivered at 7.30 last night and now being put forward. Um, in my estimation, this legislation proposes to do far more than merely restore Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64 to its legal posture prior to a series of Supreme Court decisions that occurred in May of June of 89. Instead, for the first time, this legislation would, would allow the recovery of compensatory and punitive damages in employment discrimination cases under Title VII. It will encourage costly and unnecessary litigation, delays in settling disputes, jury trials, and large damage awards. Furthermore, because disparate treatment cases are often built on statistics, quotas will be the easiest and surest way for an employer to protect against these new and potentially bankrupting remedies in H.R. 1. The alternative proposal, uh, that is to say the Democratic alternate, contains the same cap on damages as was adopted on the House floor last year. It's a phony cap in reality. It's a lidless lid. Uh, first of all, compensatory damages would be left unlimited and unchanged. Secondly, the real measurement of possible punitive damages becomes whatever a plaintiff is awarded in compensatory damages. Under the language, a plaintiff can receive up to 150000 in punitive damages or an amount of punitive damages equal to compensatory damages, whichever is greater. So if a plaintiff re recovers a million and a half in pain and suffering, they could also receive up to a million and a half in punitive damages as well. That's not a ca cap that gives much aid and comfort to employers. Since its enactment in 64, the legal remedies under Title VII have been injunctive relief and back pay. It's a statute that stresses mediation, conciliation, the prompt settlement of workplace disputes. And it was that for very good policy reasons that Congress chose not to allow unlimited compensatory and punitive damages when it first enacted Title VII. Our bill, H.R. 1375, reflects the continuing validity of the settlement approach while at the same time addressing the need to deter harassment in the workplace H.R. 1375 provides a significant new damage remedy for harassment victims without radically disrupting the Title VII remedial 
process. Another much publicized but little understood aspect of this debate focuses on the employer's burden of proof in disparate impact cases. Here again, neither HR 1 or the proposed substitute restore the same evidentiary standards that were used in disparate impact cases prior to Ward's Cove. HR 1 contains a totally new definition of business necessity. It permits a plaintiff to lump all of an employer's employment practices together, merely allege they have a discriminatory impact, and attack an employer's bottom line workforce numbers. In the Democrat substitute, if after discovery, a plaintiff is still unable to identify specific employment practices that cause disparity, the judge has a discretion to waive that requirement. In face of these blanket allegations, an employer would then have to prove that each and every one of its hiring practices either had no statistical effect or was required by business necessity. Further successful performance of the job or under the substitute, that's changed to effective job performance becomes the standard for hiring or promotion decisions. Employers will be discouraged from considering a prospective employee's long-range potential for promotion and be forced to hire persons who may only meet the minimum requirements of the job at hand. It will be an unfair employment practice to hire for excellence, not merely for adequacy. Once again, the civil rights groups and their supporters have chosen not to deal with the problematic language in this legislation that will inevitably, inexorably lead to quotas. Instead, they've come up with another new version of the term required by business necessity. Now they want employers to prove that there is a substantial, as well as a manifest, relationship between the employment practice and the job in question. What does substantial mean? The language they have selected has never been used in any court in any case, interpreting the disparate impact theory. This language has been the focus of no hearings, no testimony, and there is no legislative history as to what it could mean. What it really means is incoherence and total uncertainty for an employer. What an employer has to prove to justify the business necessity of a specific employment practice ought to be governed by the landmark case, and it's 20 years old, the Griggs case and the subsequent cases, and there are a list of them, that apply that standard. In stark contrast to H.R. 1 and the Democratic substitute, the administration's bill codifies the exact holding of Griggs and its definition of business necessity, which is, quote, manifest relationship to the employment in question, unquote. This very language has been cited in every subsequent Supreme Court case discussing the disparate impact theory since 71. The language of business necessity in the democratic substitute has never been dealt with by any court anywhere, anytime. Unquestionably, quotas will be the natural result of the new, untested, and financially threatening language in both the reported version of H.R. 1 and its new alternative. Employers will hire by the numbers to protect themselves against lengthy, complicated, and expensive lawsuits. Now this rule should allow the House to vote on my amendment that would prohibit continuation of a practice known as within group norming a practice totally inconsistent with the principles and intent of Title VII. Within group norming or race norming is a method of adjusting or altering the results of employment aptitude tests. This so-called score adjustment strategy uh, happens when an individual's actual score is converted into a percentile reflecting that person's score compared only to others in his own or her own racial or ethnic group. A group based percentile score is substituted for an individual's real score. Actual scores become meaningless, and the job relatedness value of these tests is subsumed in favor of achieving a certain racial or ethnic mix. Typically, persons who score higher on the underlying test appear to have scored lower once their within-group percentages are substituted for the actual score. While this employment practice has only recently received media attention, it's an old practice. It dates back more than a decade where it's been continuously used by state employment services across the nation with the active encouragement of the U.S. Labor Departments used in 34 states as of now. Now the Democratic substitute chooses to deal with this problem by creating a new and potentially worse problem. It appears that the civil rights advocates now want to prevent employers from using any aptitude tests at all. Their language talks about whether a particular test may be valid or fair, but it's unclear who gets to determine a test's validity and fairness. More importantly, these terms aren't defined. With no statutory guidelines, these words can mean different things to different people. For example, in the literature, 
There is literature that says fair, a test can't be fair when people have different results. Be, uh, where, where a Hispanic gets one result, a white gets one result, a black gets another result, an Asian gets another result, that by definition, that's not fair. So uh, you create more problems in the, uh, in the substitute bill than you solve. Um, here we're not talking about potential quotas, we're talking about a practice that is aimed at achieving a particular racial ethnic makeup in a workforce. I thought Title VII meant employment decisions should be made without regard to race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Um, Mr. Chairman, when the Judiciary Committee considered this legislation, amendments were offered on a number of key points. All of the amendments were offered in the House Judiciary Committee, and I might add in the, in the House Education and Labor Committee, should be permitted during consideration of H.R. 1 on the House floor. These would include the administration's equitable damage alternative to the unlimited compensatory and punitive damage contained in H.R. 1, the language from the President's bill on an employer's burden of proof in disparate impact cases and its definition of business necessity, an amendment to make it clear that the alteration or adjustment of scores on employment aptitude tests based upon race or ethnicity is an unfair employment practice and a prospective effective date for the legislation. We should be permitted to vote on a substitute containing all of the elements of the President's bill as an alternative to H.R. 1. Now the reason we'd like to vote on these amendments individually is someone may like this part and not this part of a substitute bill. It's like giving someone a continuing resolution, take it or leave it. Some people support and some people oppose these on an individual basis. That's why we'd like to offer them as amendments, not say that they're all folded into the substitute, which they may or may not be. Last year when the House co considered this legislation, it did so under a very restrictive rule. Only two amendments were made in order, both of which were drafted by the bill's proponents and offered by the chairman of the two committees having jurisdiction. For those opposed to last year's bill, H.R. 4000, a single substitute was made in order. This time we should be allowed to fully debate the bill, and I do support four hours. God help us trying to assign time to people. Um, in our committee, if we get one hour, that's half for the judiciary, half for education labor, I got a half hour. Um, you know, the Judiciary Committee needs more time, uh, as do they all. Um, this time we should be allowed to fully debate the bill. We owe it to our constituents, we owe it to this institution to have a full and open discussion. This, I'm, I'm almost through, and thanks for your indulgence. This legislation aims at preventing employment practice that could result in an unfair or disparate impact on minority groups. In a very special way, I am a member of a minority group in this House, the Republican Party a restrictive rule that interferes with my right and the right of my colleagues to offer germane amendments is a discriminatory practice that adversely affects us all. I hope this committee will adopt an open rule so that all the important issues raised by H.R. 1 and the new substitute can be fully debated and resolved on the House floor. We aren't all that busy, folks. I think we will have the time. I don't need to tell anyone that all America is watching this debate and will judge the fairness of its outcome. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the Rules Committee for this uh, opportunity to Thank you very to much, Henry. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> because of the, uh, the testimony of Mr. Hyde, uh, uh, you will be the last witness, and we will recess for, uh, we're not through with you, but just so the people in the audience, we will recess till 2 o'clock, and we'll come back immediately 2 o'clock to resume with the other witnesses. Yeah. Uh, oh, yes. No, we've got a question here. Mr. Derrick? I, I just thank you for your excellent testimony, Henry. I thought, thought it was good, and, and, and you make a strong case for having more time. I have no further. Mr. Solomon? Mr. Chairman, let me just um, say that um, I've just reviewed what we're going to be doing here for the next two or three or four weeks uh, up to the July 4th break. Uh, we've got a couple of appropriation bills each week, next week and the week after and the week after that, and we're really going to be doing nothing. And so, Henry, you certainly do make your point about there's plenty of time. You heard Mrs. Schroeder testify that she didn't believe that uh, we ought to trust non-lawyers like, like Jerry Solomon to, to have an opportunity to work uh, their will on the floor of the House but she kind of put her foot in it because later on she also admitted that she didn't think that uh, one of the foremost 
legal scholars of this. Uh, in, a, in a minute, I will. Let me in a minute. Let me make a point. Uh, she made the point that uh, that you, uh, one of the foremost legal scholars in this whole house, and who someday may even be a, a Supreme Court justice, we all oh, hope. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. She doesn't think you ought to have your Hang name. Hang on to that thought, but yeah. don't press it too hard. Yeah. Uh, let, let me just let me just say to you, Henry, that uh, I hope you will give us a a list of of the priorities that you think as the opponent to the bill uh, that uh, of the amendments we ought to to have made in order because. I have to be fair to, to my good friend Joe Moakley and the other members uh, on the majority side and to every other member of this House because, you know, if the Democrat amendments are allowed and Republican amendments are not, and if Mrs. Schroeder is allowed to amend the Republican substitute, which goes far beyond any kind of fairness, and if the majority party with a two-to-one plurality does not trust themselves to let the House work its will, I'm just going to tell you, Joe, my good friend, uh, you're going to be uh, saying again that Jerry Solomon was picking on you and uh, unfairly, but I'm going to tell you all hell is going to break loose. It's not going to be just the one day on this bill because the decision has already been made by people like me and you and others who are absolutely outraged at what we see coming down this pike. And you know, I, as the ranking Republican on this Rules Committee, I have to be here Monday morning at 8 o'clock, and I have to be here Friday night at 5 o'clock. And I'm going to tell you, somebody is going to have to pay for this unfairness if, if this happens. And who wants to do that? Why can't we work a, a rule the way we did with the defense bill? Why can't we let the House work its will? Uh, you know, I really am just outraged at what I see coming, Henry. And I, but if you give I us the, I can't believe, um, Mr. Solomon, that this uh, this committee would be so cynical as not to have an open rule on well, this uh, on this I can't vital that. legislation that affects oh. all Americans everywhere. Oh. You know, you're not under oath, Mr. This is the. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <But> I, I, <laughs> uh, in, you, in yielding to my good friend from I, Tennessee, I, swear uh, on my mother I would just like to point out to him uh, when he said. Uh, uh, that the Republican Party uh, has the historical opposition to civil rights. Uh, remember Abraham Lincoln and the founder of our Republican Party, and I yield to the gentleman. New York may be old enough to remember um, <laughs> that, that, that incident, but I am not. Um, I am. I, I just think in the spirit of fairness that the gentleman has called upon that it would be appropriate to point out that uh, Ms. Schroeder never said that non-lawyers uh, should not be allowed to participate in the debate on the floor, and I think a clear reading of the record oh, would indicate that while there is oh, some difference. Oh, you're okay. right. Yeah, absolutely. She never said that. She just said don't offer amendments. It's too technical. But you can talk. They let you talk unless you go over time. I appreciate the gentleman's point. I'm going to get a copy of that record and read it back. I, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Hyde, we still d would like a copy of our substitute. Uh, do we? Uh, I, and that's, uh, uh, as we say, above my pay grade. Who's got the substitute? <laughs> Mr. Michaels, I'm told, and we should get a copy today. Uh, oh. uh, didn't we file this bill some time ago? See, I don't want to embarrass your friend, Mr. Solomon, by asking all these questions. You're not no. embarrassing me at all. Well, Mr. Michael uh, has it. Uh, the uh, it's the, the so-called Michael substitute, not mine, but we filed it. It's got a number, so I should think you can get a copy of it. H.R. 1375, yeah. some time ago. 1375, all right. If sure. Jim, if Jim would yield, uh, uh, there, there is, uh, we received the uh, Democrat substitute last night at about 7.30. Uh, now I understand that that is not in final form, that Mr. Stenholm is working uh, some arrangements there. We, we, ours is in its final form. Uh, you just heard the number. And we may have a couple of changes in ours, the same as you Democrats may have in yours. We'll treat everybody the same. Fair. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Thank you. It's always okay. a pleasure. The Rules Committee will recess until the hour of 2 o'clock. Okay. Committee on Rules will now come to order. We are currently hearing H.R. 1, Civil Rights Act of 1991, and uh, we recessed uh, so the members could have something to eat. And uh, we'll now 
coming to order, and our first witness will be the Honorable Bill McCollum of Florida. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. May I uh, ask a uh, favor? Uh, Fred Grandy has got to go to, to an ethics oh, meeting, fine. and he yeah. and it's uh, permissible for them to oh, sit that's together. Fine. Is that all right? Absolutely. I to mention mm. it to you. I. Uh, I didn't know about this, or I would have done it earlier, Fred. Well, Mr. Chairman, let Let's me say see. I am not before the Ethics Committee. I am <laughs> on the Ethics Committee. <laughs> oh, and we have a meeting. And by the way, your name isn't before us either, Mr. That's Chairman. it. <laughs> uh, the uh, committee will be happy to hear from the Honorable Fred Grandy of Iowa at the same time. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I today am going to be very brief with this, but the amendment that I've come before you particularly upon is one which was offered in the full committee, and it's one that I would like to offer on the floor with respect to the Democrat or the Brooks substitute if uh, given that opportunity or, of course, should that not prevail on, on H.R. 1 itself. It deals with the question of punitive and compensatory damages in my statements in the record. I'd just like to summarize if I could. Um, but it does not provide a cap. It is a different kind of amendment. And I might say at the outset that if there is an opportunity for a debate over the whole cap question, I certainly support Mr. Grandy's effort <clears throat> to have an amendment offered that would apply punitive damage or compensatory damage cap to all of the questions of employment discrimination law, including 1981. I think that uh, that point's well made. But what I proposed is, is that we have a, instead of compensatory and punitive damages, uh, we, that we abide by the existing law under Title VII and then add a special provision for equitable relief that judges can grant in the area of harassment whether that's sexual harassment or harassment on the basis of race or religion or whatever in the employment place. And <clears throat> this seems to me to be the favored option to go that route, rather than to have uh, a compensatory and punitive damage door open that will uh, suddenly open up jury trials, which don't now exist under Title VII, and open up the opportunity for an awful lot of additional litigation. The history of Title VII shows that, uh, on the average, uh, there are very few cases where people have complained and felt that they had a problem with the back pay and the reinstatement, which are currently the provisions of uh, the law that are the relief under Title VII. <clears throat> and when they do have those problems, it is for harassment in the workplace. That is the area that we hear the people saying, and you heard some of it this morning, uh, we need some relief. We need the opportunity for a punitive and compensatory damage type thing for harassment. My, pr my amendment would simply offer the opportunity for that to be pled as an equitable relief matter before a judge who's hearing a case of employment discrimination. And he could award up to $150,000 in equitable relief for harassment in the employment place against uh, an employee. And I think if that's done, my amendment does not touch 1981 at all because it leaves the present law in place, but it does strip out <clears throat> all punitive and compensatory damage issues of new law that would be put in by the proponents of H.R. 1 and the amendment dealing with it. And I would uh, encourage my colleagues to allow me to offer this. I said I offered it in full committee. It is a provision that is in the President's proposed civil rights bill, and it addresses the problem that is really there with respect to the complaints that say, hey, we don't really have a, a good remedy now where you have harassment. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Grandy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me say at the outset, I concur with everything our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Solomon, has said about advocating an open rule. And I would hope that the committee would, would look favorably on that decision. But absent that, I would like to offer an amendment to the committee to be made in order uh, under the rule. That is a simple amendment, but I will have to admit a very controversial one. I guess I would have to describe it as the converse of what Representative Schroeder, uh, Waters, uh, Norton, and Kennelly were advocating this morning in that I, I draw the same arguments, that our present system is unfair, that there is a disparity of justice between uh, racial discrimination and sexual discrimination. But I come to a different conclusion. I would say that if we are going to argue that caps are appropriate, and it would appear from the democratic substitute that will be offered, I assume, under the rule that caps are appropriate, then all titles involving discrimination should be capped, not just Title VII, but Section 1981 as well. So my amendment would amend Section 8 of H.R. 1, which expands Title VII remedies to include punitive and compensatory damages in intentional discrimination cases to limit to $150,000 the total amount of such damages which could be recovered. 
But the amendment would, would also cap on such damages recoverable under 42 U.S. Code 1981 as applied to employment discrimination, and that's important. Employment discrimination is all we are talking about here. The cap would not apply, however, to any lost back pay. The purpose, again, similar to the arguments that were made earlier this morning, is to establish parity between the amount of damages which b could be recovered for discrimination based on race, color, sex, religion, and national origin. Title VII, which covers discrimination based on all of these categories, limits remedies to lost back pay. Section 90, 1981, which currently covers only race discrimination, allows unlimited unlimited punitive and compensatory damages. Thus, for example, a plaintiff in a case involving sex discrimination is eligible for lesser remedies, lost back pay only, than a plaintiff in a case involving race discrimination who would qualify for unlimited punitive and compensatory damages. In a sense, Mr. Chairman, to, to reiterate some of the arguments against uh, okay. caps that were made this morning by Mr. Schroeder, what we have right now, without my amendment being offered, is legislation that could conceivably pit women against each other. Black women having one right of redress under 1981, white women being limited only to Title VII. My amendment would rectify, but albeit cap, the damages that they could, they could sue for. Now, the proponents of 1981 would argue that this cap would be closed through raising remedies under, uh, the gap would, should be closed under, through raising remedies under Title VII to those under 1981, and that is we would have unlimited punitive and compensatory damages. I have a little problem with this reasoning because I would ask why does closing the gap necessarily be, why should that be the standard that should be set uh, as, as level for damages under 1981? Why should we go to an unlimited uh, right of redress? Indeed, if anything, the fact that punitive and compensatory damages are virtually unknown in labor law indicates that perhaps Section 1981, at least as applied to employment, again, is out of line. It's an anomaly and it should not be used as the proper standard to achieve parity. So the conclusion is also compelled by the negatives associated with these kinds of damages. I might also add that a bill with unlimited damages, it is probably at this point safe to say, is not going to pass this Congress. So I would ask, who does this help? You might also argue that Title VII's remedies of lost back pay, given its broader scope as compared to Section 1981 and its greater consistency with other labor laws, should be looked upon for guidance. In other words, that is the standard that we ought to use for labor law. But considering the spirit of compromise and in light of the fact that the President's bill amends Title VII to allow for a remedy of $150,000 for harassment, I believe that a cap of $150,000 for all cases is a reasonable approach. It would create parity between race and sex-based discrimination, and I think at a fairly generous level, Mr. Chairman, and I will submit for the record the, uh, I believe it's the last nine cases that have been awarded compensatory damages under Section 1981 and, and STAIR state fair employment laws, and you will see that $150,000 is roughly the mean of those damages. At the same time, Mr. Chairman, the massive increase in inexpensive litigation many expect will occur under H.R. 1 will to some degree, some degree be avoided. Unfortunately, if you go the other way and assume the Schroeder uh, approach, you would take the cap off section of off Title VII and I think perhaps uh, create a license to sue and perhaps a license to settle and raise damages above the rough level that we have right now. The figure also seems reasonable in light of the Shea and Gardner study, which is often cited in support of H.R. 1. Proponents steadfastly claim that that study showed that compensatory and punitive damages were, award were awarded in only 69 of 594 cases decided under Section 1981 between 1980 and 1990, and that in two-thirds of these 69 cases, the total damage award was 50,000 or less. Hence, I offer 150,000, assuming this study is accurate, as a fair compromise. And I, I would just say, Mr. Chairman, again, I have some material to be submitted for the record about damages under Section 1981 that I would ask to be included with my statement. Just to, to summarize. Without objection, the uh, gentleman I was a entire statement will be on the record. Thank you. I am offering the converse of what Mrs. Schroeder offered this morning. I propose to cap both Section 1981 for racial discrimination and Title 12. In other words, take 
just the injunctive relief that Mr. McCullum proposed, raise that to $150,000 for harassment, and even the two sections so that nobody will be denied redress for discrimination in the courts, but the cap will apply equally. And I would consider uh, that uh, this committee, if they consider the Schroeder Amendment, should consider the Grandy Amendment because they are equal and opposite and should have the advantage of a fair debate, uh, certainly against each other. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Grandy. Mr. Barnier, any questions? Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, say the gentleman knows how I feel about uh, his member, both of you, as a matter of fact, and that uh, we're going to do everything we can to make it in order. Uh, and out of fairness, uh, both of you should be allowed uh, uh, to have your amendment. We'll do what we can to help. Mr. Wade, Mr. McHugh. No question. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The uh, Honorable Tom Campbell. Now we'll hear from a real law professor. <laughs> Tom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I guess. <laughs> I'd uh, ask the uh, chairman to submit my testimony in total. Without objection, the entire statement of Mr. Campbell will appear on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I am uh, here in an unusual position. I'm a proud uh, Republican and proud to anticipate voting in favor of the Civil Rights Act. And let me just say at the start that uh, Boy, it really makes my job tough if the rule isn't open. I know it's hard to get that, but in my particular position, being in the minority party and arguing on behalf of the Civil Rights Bill, if we can't even get in a, a, recent, a, a, a decent number of amendments to the floor, yeah, well, it makes my job tough. So I'd, I'd strongly like to urge that an open rule be adopted. And I know that my colleague, Mr. Solomon, has been making that point. I'm here today. Uh, with a colleague, actually, Congressman Russo, and we are offering an amendment dealing with Martin versus Wilkes. It's complex, but it's very important. It's the only part of the Civil Rights Bill that we have before us that I think there's a substantial constitutional question about. And it's also the only part which, in the verbiage of the Civil Rights Bill, actually has a statement at the end that says, by the way, if this violates due process, we don't mean it. Which is a pretty interesting signal about, about what we're doing. I'm referring to page 50 of the uh, committee print of H.R. 1, and it's repeated again in the, in the uh, Fish Brooks substitute, where at the end of this provision, which restricts people's right to challenge consent decrees, it says, by the way, though, that, that's not fair. It doesn't say, by the way. It says, we do not intend to, then quote, authorize or permit the denial to any person of the due process of law required by the United States Constitution, end quote. Here's the problem. A decree is entered, and let's just take an example. Suppose it's a firefighter's uh, unit, and suppose that Hispanics have not been adequately represented in that firefighter's unit. And suppose the decree says that there have been roughly 25 percent of the applicants who've been Hispanic over the last few years. So uh, over the next several years, and it's not specific as to how many, 25 percent of the new firefighters are going to have to be Hispanic. Take that as an example. Suppose that decree is entered in, uh, in 1980. Suppose there's a young person in high school or grade school who's 10, 11 years old, 1980. 1991, that young man applies, and he's an Anglo. Under the law that we are going to be debating, and it's true under the committee mark, it's true under the, the Brooks Fish substitute, that young man could not challenge that, even though he was, he was 10 years old at the time it was entered. And he couldn't challenge it because the restriction in the bill says that you cannot enter a challenge to a litigated or consent judgment, A, if you had notice of it, fine. I, believe me, that I understand. That's right. B, by a person with respect to whom that first subparagraph was not satisfied, in other words, you didn't get the notice, if the court determines that the interests of such person were adequately represented by another person who challenged such judgment or order prior to or after the entry of such judgment or order. And that's not fair, not to me anyway. The fact that some other, in this instance, my hypothetical, Anglo male, 
at the time might have challenged it, shouldn't keep this other person just because he happens to be white and, and male. Then we have category C. So you can't, if, if the court determined somebody else was there at the time, even though you weren't, well, technically, even if you weren't born, but in my instance, if you weren't of, of reason. Or C, if the court that entered the judgment or order determines that reasonable efforts were made to provide notice to interested persons, end quote. That's, that's remarkable. I mean, that's extremely broad. That's to say that if you got no notice, if you couldn't have gotten notice, and then under B, if you're not even represented by somebody who represented your interests, if the court determined that reasonable efforts were made at the time to provide notice to who were then interested persons, you're knocked out. And so why are we doing this if it's such a, an egregious thing? Well, the reason is, I think, largely that firefighting units and police departments and cities that have these decrees entered into, against them, they don't want to have to litigate all the time. That's really the genesis. They say, look, we litigated it once. We don't want to open it up all the time. And I have a very simple answer to them, because this is the law since Martin versus Wilkes. The, the, we're changing the law. And what happens is when a new c complainant comes in and says, I don't think that this is uh, a correct decree, the judge says, you got any new facts? You got any new law? If not, case dismissed. But at least you got into the courtroom. It can be over in a day. It can be over in, in really, in, in, in a 30-minute hearing. But at least you were in. That's why I think it's a, it's, it's a question of fairness. The other reason why I, comp I, I urge this committee to, to allow my amendment to be in order to strike this provision is the monitoring. Take my example again. You'll never know when enough 25% set aside is enough. You'll never know when the job is done, except when somebody comes forward and says, I, I'm affected, and I think it's time that that decree is over. That's how our court system works. Somebody who's affected comes forward and says, time's run, at which point the judge might say, OK, well, what is the application rate now? And let's say, for example, that the community is, is much less Hispanic. Let's say it's now 10% Hispanic, and the applications are running 10%, and the selections are 10%. Then it should terminate. But you'd never hear that case unless somebody got a chance to bring it. So I think it's a question of fairness. It's a question of allowing monitoring. And also, it should give, give us some substantial worry under the Constitution, as I suggested, that the draftspersons of this bill were so worried that at the end, they put in a provision saying, we're, we're going to go as far as we can go, provided we don't actually violate due process of law under the Constitution. And I, I think we should do more than just go to the outermost edge of, of the Constitution. In conclusion, my amendment is to strike the entire provision. It's simple, and I heard the arguments of my colleagues who went before that we don't want to open up this debate to a whole bunch of complexities. But if five different Supreme Court opinions, they, they weren't issued the same day, they weren't issued in tandem. Martin versus Wilkes was separate from all the other opinions. Martin versus Wilkes said, you've got your day in court. Martin versus Wilkes said, yeah, it can be expedited, it can be a 30 second or 30 minute hearing, but you got your right. So I don't see why this has to be debated in a take-it-or-leave-it basis. For example, I strongly believe Ward's Cove should be reversed. That's why I'm voting for the Civil Rights Bill, because I think the burden of proof allocation is that the Supreme Court did in Ward's Cove was wrong. But I, I can't abide the outcome in Martin versus Wilkes. So that's why I'd like to have a chance to vote on it separately. Uh, in my testimony, I have the endorsements of just the sort of organizations you'd expect. There's plenty of them. Uh, people who want to represent folks who would otherwise be stopped from presenting their point and in conclusion, I'm uh, proud also having the support of our uh, ranking Republican on judiciary and uh, our Republican task force chair, uh, Mr. Hyde. Thank you very much, Tom. Any questions? Mr. Derrick. Uh, Tom, I'm sorry I missed part of your uh, uh, testimony. But you, I was referring to you this morning. You were a, uh, I believe you were a law, legal professor, law professor at Stanford, was that right? I still am. Oh, you I, still are. I never resigned. The uh, ethics committee allows you to You must have tenure then. A little, yes, sir. Uh, a little more solid than being in Congress. Mr. Mr. Derrick, it's harder to get tenure at Stanford than to get elected to Congress, so I, <laughs> I wasn't giving that up. <laughs> Touche. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for your kind reference to me earlier. Mr. Solomon. 
Tom, uh, some things are unfair. Um, you're a law professor, and uh, you were allowed to continue. I'm a businessman, and I was forced to sell my business when I was elected to Congress. Uh, well, you have just made the most compelling successful. argument of exactly why we ought to have an open rule. Uh, you know, in most of the amendments that we want to offer on our side, it's true that they were voted down on a party line vote. Uh, why should they not be allowed then to be voted down on a party line vote on the floor of the House and let the Congress work its will? The reason is that they would not be voted down on a party line vote. We all know it. That's why we're going to be saddled with this unfair closed rule. Uh, in your case, that was not the case. I happen to know that you were out in California that day and you were unable to offer this amendment. But uh, certainly this is one of the significant issues that is just uh, prevalent throughout that whole bill that ought to be debated on the floor and uh, with, with, so that the entire nation can hear that debate. If they could hear your arguments today, your amendment would pass overwhelmingly and let you, yet you're going to be gagged and not being allowed. It's too bad because you deserve it. And so does Mr. Vivumi over there and everybody else. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Mr. Frost. No question. Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Tom, you make, uh, as always, very eloquent arguments. Uh, was there any kind of discussion at all in committee? Am I understanding you weren't you okay. weren't able to offer the amendment sure. in committee? Is that That's right. right. It sorry, was I was late coming in. Not not at all. It was offered uh, last time by my colleague from New Hampshire, Mr. Douglas. Right. And uh, was fully debated and then not accepted and then off then again. Why wasn't it accepted? I mean, if, if did, did he just not make the case as well as you could or? <laughs> uh, no, I'm sure he did an eloquent job. Yeah. I, uh, the votes weren't there. Uh, uh -huh. And then we tried it again on the uh, floor last time, two years ago when I came to this committee, and it was not made in order. Uh, this particular day was uh, March 19th, the day of the markup, and uh, that it was uh, my father's birthday. Uh, my father passed away uh, a year, uh, uh, well, it's three years now, but it was uh, just three weeks before I was elected to Congress, and I chose that day to declare my candidacy for the United States Senate. It was very important that I declare on that day. As a result, I was in California and uh, missed the, the, uh, rules, the uh, civil rights debate. What, what is your uh, sense about the bill if this amendment is not made in order? I'm, tr I'm very troubled. I will vote for the bill with uh, great difficulty, but I will because of the importance it's that I attach to giving women a remedy for harassment on the job. Right now, under federal law, all a woman can get if she's harassed on the job is reinstatement, possibly even working for the same person who harassed her. Mm -hmm. And that's just not fair, it seems to me. So that's really important to me. But along the line, as you know so well, you're my, my senior here, and in many ways uh, a teacher to me, you get a combination of things in a bill and you have to say yes or no to the whole thing. So this is one of the aspects that I'm very troubled by. And if it were standing free and clear, I would vote strongly against this reversal of Martin versus Wilkes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wade. Mr. McHugh. Any questions? No. Tom, thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> the Honorable Steve Gunderson. First of all, Mr. Oh, nice Chairman, let me say that uh, I don't know how any of you have the patience to go through this day in and day out. I sit here for one day waiting to testify, and I, I marvel at the patience that the members of this committee have. Uh, but I indeed appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of you. We have a wonderful Chairman. That's really Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll hear about it out of the floor when this bill comes to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I could say you have the opportunity to uh, determine how wonderful you are, um, but... Uh, I'm going to hide it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I serve as the ranking Republican on the subcommittee uh, in Ed and Labor that has jurisdiction over this, both this session and last session, so I'm very familiar with the bill. But I come before you today with one particular item that I really believe is an item uh, of which uh, members on both sides of this issue can unite because it will allow us to really answer the question of is this a civil rights bill or is it an attorney rights bill. I understand the argument that is made by many people advocating this legislation which suggests that it is indeed necessary 
that we provide remedies above and beyond those which presently exist to deal with discrimination in the workforce. That is the whole reason we have before us jury trials, punitive and compensatory damages. And we can argue about the caps and those elements of that particular debate. But that's a separate argument from the amendment that I bring before you. I bring before you an amendment that suggests that we ought to clarify the whole issue of attorney fees in the language. Because believe it or not, in a small provision in section 107 of the uh, substitute 4 uh, that is announced as of yesterday, or section 207 of H.R. 1, there is a provision in there which, believe it or not, overrules three different Supreme Court cases, the Jeff D. case, the Merrick case, and the Zipes case, for the benefit of lawyers. In one section, largely ignored in the debate thus far, we are go so far as to say that no settlement can occur without the conditional approval of the attorney and the attorney pre fees provisions. It is legitimate, I think, to allow and to debate what additional remedies a victim of discrimination ought to have. I don't think anybody on either side of this issue, however, is advocating that not the victim, but the lawyer ought to determine the outcome of that particular remedy and solution. Under the legislation is drafted, let's assume that a victim of discrimination files suit against their employer. And as a result of that, uh, you begin the discovery and all the other processes, and you have an agreement that is reached out of court. And you have a consent decree that is filed, or that they desire to file. And yet, the plaintiff attorney says, no, I am not going to voluntarily agree to that consent decree. I want to litigate this through the courts, through a jury, to whatever outcome I can get. That attorney, not the victim, under Section 107 of the Substitute, has the right to prevent this case from resolution. And that is why I suggest to you that the language used by Governor Lawton Childs in his dis veto just last week of a similar civil rights bill in Florida has relevance today. And let me just read two sections from his veto statement. The greatest threat to the civil rights reform movement are laws that mislead the public by raising their expectations only to discover that the greatest beneficiaries are the lawyers who are involved in this process. And he goes on, I am committed to a system for redressing unlawful discrimination that provides timely and effective remedies without inducing lawsuits that drag on for years and making adversarial proceedings the preferred form. If we need additional remedies, and I will accept that in some cases we do today, I think we ought to also have as a part of that process the ability of the aggrieved party when they reach an agreement with their employer to resolve that case rather than to continue litigating it in the courts. The only way that can be done is if my amendment is made in order. Thank you, Steve. Mr. Derrick? I have no questions. Mr. Dreyer? I have no questions other than the Any questions on the side of the aisle? Steve, thank you very much. Harris Farrell. Yes. Could I ask Adam's consent that uh, a statement from Mr. Goodling, uh, who was unable to appear to be uh, in the record under this section? Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will appear on the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have, uh, I have two amendments, both um, I think I can explain in rather brief language. The uh, first one is the one uh, marked uh, number nine, and it pertains, both the amendments pertain to the proof by the employer of business necessity. And that definition, as you probably know, has been changing every so often. And I gather that in the, uh, in the substitute, it'll be changing again. But this amendment simply makes it clear that an employer's use of an applicant's academic achievements in its hiring and promotion practices is presumed to be, and I quote, to be relevant to a significant relationship to successful performance of the job. That's the latest definition of business necessity. And business necessity is what the employer, of course, has to prove 
in order to be able to justify his hiring and his promotion criteria that he uses in hiring people and in promoting them. Unless Congress gives the signal to both employers and employees that academic achievements are important enough to be presumed, and I emphasize that word, to be job related, that is to be included with an acceptable job selection criteria, no one else will. If Congress fails to give this signal, few employers will take the risk of including academic achievements as part of their employment selection criteria, which must, of course, meet the standards of having, and again I quote, a significant relationship to successful performance of a job. Thus, students will continue to get the message that achievements in academics are not important to, to employers or to Congress, at least not important enough that we presume that good grades and academic excellence will or should help at least in getting a job. In reality, there is not one person on this committee or one in the entire Congress who does not include academic achievements as part of what they consider in their hiring criteria. We all take it for granted that the young people who have ambitions to be employed in Capitol Hill should understand this. Such presumptions, which are legitimate, <coughs> serve as academic incentives, and it's no less true in most other jobs. We should remove any doubt whether academic achievements are important enough to be a part of the employer's employment practices involving selection, hiring, and promotion in this bill. They should be presumed to be job-related, and that is all that this amendment does. Will such a presumption produce some disparate impact on protected classes in, the, in employment? Yes. But it, after all, is only a presumption. If, acad if academic achievements are not relevant, and again I quote, to a significant relationship to successful performance on the job, end of quote, the presumption will be rebutted and the courts will not allow them to stand. More important, however, is the fact that young people, black or white, Hispanic, male or female, and regardless of religion or national origin, will get the message that good grades and academic achievements <coughs> are important, that education counts, and that it is a door to jobs and economic advancement. We should let any law, we should not let any law that has, that serves as an incentive to underachieve scholastically, especially when we know that education is a key which can help unlock doors of opportunity for all young people of all races, religions, and creeds. To me, in summary of this amendment, it seems ludicrous that we would, in effect, say to young people all over this nation that we would hesitate at all in stating that academic achievements is something that does count and that any employer who uses academic achievements in rating or reviewing or analyzing applicants in trouble would be dragged into court on the charge of unintentional discrimination, and that's what we're talking about here, disparate, analysis, disparate impact, not disparate treatment. I presented this in committee. It was defeated, frankly, on a straight uh, party line vote. But to me, it's common sense. And when we get to the point where the Congress is saying that we will not presume that academic achievements are something that you can look at when you interview a prospective employer, employee, then I think we're just doing something that's plain dumb. It's something that if the people of this nation recognize that that's what we're saying in this kind of a bill, they would rebel and they will eventually, I think, react in a very negative way. That, Mr. Chairman, is, uh, is my uh, amendment number, number one. Oh. My, uh, it reminds me of a story of a fellow who applied for a job as a handyman. And he went into the foreman, and the foreman said, okay, I want you to help the carpenter over there. He said, oh, I don't do any carpentering work. He said, all right, go over there and help the glazier. He said, oh, I don't do any glazier work either. He says, well, you know, help the fellow set up the foundation over there, the, the moving platform. He said, oh, I don't do that. He says, well, what makes you such a handyman? He says, I only live across the street. So this, this wouldn't affect your bill at all. Mr. Derrick. No questions. 
Solomon. I apologize uh, for, for not being here. Uh, for, here uh, which, which, you have number three six. amendments. And number six is the only one that you are looking for at this point? No, I, I have two amendments. And the one that I just referred to was the Academic Achievements Amendment, which would simply make it clear that it is presumed that academic achievements are something which every employer would have a right to take into consideration sure. when interviewing an employee and that he would not, as a result of that, and that causing a disparate impact, unintentional discrimination be dragged into court and be subject to the, uh, the unintentional discrimination charges, which always has a second count of intentional discrimination charges. Uh, and that's, that's basically what the bill does. I can't see where, especially the Education and Labor Committee, because it only thought, I think, with its right side of its brain at that particular point, could ever say, that educational uh, achievements is something that an employer could not justifiably look at. Yet this bill has the effect of saying you can't even do that under the Titan definition of business necessity, which is what the employer has to prove in order to be able to justify any employment practice that brings about a disparate or unintentional <laughs> impact. Now, if, if we've come to that, I, I think, man, <laughs> we, we have come to a strange position. And that's what the bill does. You'd have to rewrite all the civil service laws on the federal level. In New York State, uh, uh, you'd have to do the same thing. Uh, yeah. What a mess. Let me, uh, with the gentleman. Yeah. Let me make sure I understand. What you're saying is that we don't uh, put any weight on education merely because we eliminate it? I mean, we do not mention that as a criteria. The, uh, the Griggs case originally said mm. that you cannot consider, for instance, a high school diploma in what is a very unskilled position. I think it was a coal shoveler at an at a, um, energy plant. I can understand, and in those circumstances, I think a court would probably again say, depending on the facts and circumstances, that the use of a high school diploma was a way of screening out some of the minorities. But now that we're going especially into highly skilled jobs, every job, no matter high, how highly skilled, is now subject to dis disparate impact, even those jobs which utilize subjective criteria, like uh, how much ambition does a person have, uh, is there fire in a person's belly? All these kinds of things. But one thing that is deeply suspect is any academic achievements, because that does tend to obviously build a disparate impact, especially in certain areas where the minorities have not had the opportunity to be able to get the kind of education that others have. But as the Los Angeles Personnel Commission that testified before our Education Committee said you're giving exactly the wrong answer, the wrong incentive. You're basically saying education doesn't count, the diploma doesn't count, the academic achievements don't count. Don't mention those things. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Floss? Yep. Mr. Dreyer? Anybody over there? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fowler. The other amendment, I have one more. Oh, I'm sorry. I hate to take up uh, much of your time, but the Second Amendment uh, simply states that the definition of business necessity and the evidence submitted by an employer in proof of business necessity, that is that there's job relatedness, shall, be, shall not be construed to exclude the use of subjective evidence. Uh, while job qualifications for basic and highly mechanistic jobs uh, that can be validated by simply objective tests and things of that sort is one thing. Where you have more highly skilled jobs, which are now, as I've indicated before, subject to disparate analysis and disparate impact analysis, there you need to have subjective inquiries in regard to, for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, an interview or a rating in regard to the person's ambition and general subjective and intangible things, which all of us in this room do every time we interview somebody for a job. The bill, however, states that as a practical matter, you can only offer in court objective evidence. You're not allowed to bring in subjective evidence in order to prove 
subjective criteria. Now, again, I believe that uh, this is one of the hundreds of arcane provisions in this bill that a lot of us haven't had the time and or the inclination to be able to dig out and recognize what we are doing as we tighten the definition of business necessity far beyond any recognition of Gra uh, the, the Griggs case or, or any other case. We're, we're paving new ground entirely. But when we do it, we should not have, as we have in this bill, provisions which state that the only evidence you can present would be tests and other objective forms of evidence in order to be able to prove, that is the employer, when the employer goes to prove that uh, a particular employment practice uh, produces a disparate impact and he comes in to prove, for instance, that the interview process or looking for, uh, let us say, writing skills or looking for other subjective criteria, evaluating whether a person has the ambition or the drive, things of this sort, which are all subjective and are all very much a part of, uh, of the highly skilled, semi-skilled and highly skilled <laughs> jobs, that to say that you can only use in court objective evidence and that you cannot produce by expert testimony or by other means subjective evidence is to say to the employer, in effect, you're not going to win this case. And I think Tom Sowell, a columnist, uh, wrote in this subject, has said that we have so many intangibles and subjective problems in regard to proving a case like this, who's ever given the burden of proof is the one who, by and large, ends up uh, not being able to prove the case, regardless of guilt or innocence or anything else. So this amendment simply says that subjective evidence can be used in the process of proving business necessity. That is to say, the job relatedness, the, how the employment practice relates to the effective job performance, which is the definition now for business necessity as we have it in this bill. Any questions? Any questions? So, uh, <laughs> just hope we can make your notes in order. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Oh, okay. Thank you. The Honorable uh, Congressman Fulmay of Maryland, I, I know you've been here from the opening gun, and I uh, appreciate your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Somewhere it's written that the last shall be first. <laughs> and uh, not I'll use that as <laughs> not in the Rules Committee. Um, let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of this committee for your indulgence. It has been a long morning, and in fact, now it's turning into a long afternoon. But I uh, appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and to, to offer an amendment. I'd like to say, however, from the outset that um, I have some reservations, even with the bill that we will be voting on because in my estimation and from my side of the river, uh, it does not do enough in my estimation to secure and to protect equally the rights of women and of persons of African and Hispanic uh, origin in this nation. However, having said that, I recognize I'm an animal of my environment. We've gotten to this point through the process of compromise. I'm prepared to uh, support uh, the bill as it will come to the floor. However, <laughs> I have an amendment that I think perfects it to some extent, and I would uh, like just a moment uh, to read into the record the justification of the amendment. Mr. Chairman, after the uh, Judiciary and Education Labor Committees completed their hearings and their markups on the Civil Rights Bill, the Supreme Court ruled on March 26, 1991, that Title VII does not apply to Americans working abroad for firms owned or controlled by American-based multinational corporations. The case that I speak specifically of is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission versus the Arabian American Oil Company. In this particular case, the petitioner, who happened to be a naturalized United States uh, citizen born in Lebanon and working in Saudi Arabia, uh, was fired by his employer, Aramco of Delaware. After filing suit with the EEOC, the petitioner then filed suit in district court, seeking, of course, relief under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, claiming, as he did, that he had been discriminated against because of his race, religion, and also, in this instance, his national origin. 
Uh, in ruling against the claim, the court held that it did not have, quote, the proper subject matter jurisdiction because Title VII's protections did not extend to United States citizens employed abroad by American employers. And thus, as I indicated earlier, on March 26 of this year, the Supreme Court concluded that Title VII does not apply extraterritorially to American firms operating abroad because congressional intent regarding Title VII's extraterritoriality is ambiguous and, in their opinion, did not overcome the well-established presumption against statutory extraterritoriality. Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that the uh, Congress intended to leave a whole category of Americans, uh, and particularly American workers, unprotected. This is essentially the position that the EEOC and the Department of Justice argued in the case EEOC versus Aramco. In fact, the EEOC has argued and defended uh, this position in several other cases throughout uh, the decade. However, to be absolutely sure, I have drafted a remedial extraterritorial, extraterritorial legislation that I believe is equitable. I think it's germane to the Civil Rights Act of 1991 and entirely appropriate to be offered as an amendment. Uh, my bill essentially uses the amended language from the Age Discrimination Employment Act of 1967, Public Law 98459. Uh, the Older Americans Act amendments of 1984 amended the ADA to, uh, ADEA to provide extraterritorial coverage for older workers abroad. Uh, that law was passed, I might add, overwhelmingly uh, by this House in September of 1984 with the support of many of the current members of the House and Senate. In fact, every member of this committee uh, supported and voted for that conference report except for three, uh, the last three of which who were not on the committee at that time. Uh, and indeed, there were only two members of the entire House who voted against it. My amendment defines an employee with respect to employment in a foreign country as a person who is a citizen of the United States. Additionally, the amendment exempts an employer from this position uh, uh, provision if, in fact, it causes the employer to violate the laws of the foreign country within which it is operating. That provision, I think, is necessary so as not to place corporations in a no-win situation if said nation has a law stating that their nationals should have first preference for employment opportunities. Uh, the amendment further stipulates that an American-controlled firm whose uh, place of practice is a foreign country shall not engage in any practice that is prohibited by sections 703 and 704, and additionally, uh, any practice that is prohibited under those sections of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, would not apply to foreign operations of an employer that is a foreign person not controlled uh, by an American <coughs> employer. Finally, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the determination of whether or not an employer controls a corporation shall be based on the interrelation of operations, common management, centralized control of labor relations and the common ownership uh, or financial control of the employer and the corporation. Regarding the effective dates, the amendments would take effect on the date of enactment and would not apply to conduct occurring before the date of the enactment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have obtained estimates that there are approximately 2.2 million private sector employees and about 140,000 federal government employees abroad. And in my estimation, that is clearly too large a number of Americans to leave unprotected by Title VII. And I earnestly hope that we can at long last settle the issue of congressional intent with regard to extraterritorial application of Title VII provisions. Uh, it's my preference to have the amendment included within the Civil Rights Act of 1991. However, I'd be more than gratified to have the opportunity to offer it uh, as a freestanding amendment, and I believe that if it's argued upon its merits, a majority of our colleagues will concur with my position, as was the case with the conference report on the Older Americans Act of 1984. And that will, uh, Mr. Chairman, conclude my testimony at this point, and I will be more than happy to entertain any questions from members of the committee. Thank you very much. Any questions? No. Frost? Swazi, you make a, a compelling case. Um, have you discussed this matter with the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Mr. Brooks? Uh, yes, I did. And I was not privy to the late night discussions last night where members were working very hard to hammer out uh, the final um, uh, 
language and structure of the uh, bill that will be before us tomorrow. It was my hope yesterday when I uh, concluded my day that, in fact, those provisions and the provisions of this particular amendment that I'm offering would be included uh, in the bill itself. Uh, I've not received confirmation of that, but if you could shed some light on it, I would appreciate it. I don't think we know any more than you do at this stage, but I, uh, uh, as I said, you make a compelling case. I would think particularly in light of the uh, activity that is likely to be conducted by American uh, firms in rebuilding Kuwait, that there will be uh, hundreds or thousands of American nationals uh, working in that effort uh, in the next uh, several years. Well, you're absolutely correct. Um, and while that was not the sole motivation, it was certainly a consideration that uh, factored in to my desire to want to extend these protections as we've done it for older Americans uh, and for other Americans covered under uh, previous and, and existing social legislation. Okay. I was just wondering also if there's any indication that you might be able to move this as a separate piece of legislation if it were not included in the, uh, the package at this time, if Mr. Brooks or his staff has given you any indication. Yes. I, 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 it's my understanding that this, in this uh, your testimony, your, your uh, amendment is in the the uh, substitute. Well, I um, again, it was late last night when they concluded work on it, and I've not uh, been advised. But if that in fact is the case, uh, then it's gratifying to note, and I would um, yield back to the chairman. It's the understanding of council that your language is in the uh, one of the substitutes. Well. And which, which substitute, Mr. Well, Chairman? The Democrats. The Democratic. <laughs> we, we worked until the wee hours, too, and we took care of it. The one that's going to pass, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank, thank you very Mr. much. Uh, as I say, I, I agree with Mr. Frost that I, I think it is a very uh, good idea, well thought out. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Sullivan, do you have anything to say? No, I just think he, he deserved his day in court, and under my He's open rule, it. you would have had it. Thank you. And under my closed rule, you still have it. <laughs> Thank Mr. you. Dreyer. And in, in light of that, uh, I'm sure that my friend would call on this committee to support an open rule and ensure that possibly in the package it were to slip out before getting to the floor, that the gentlemen still have that right to offer it under an open rule. Well, you know, if I thought I had any influence whatsoever over this committee, I probably would stand up and do that. Uh, however, I, I would uh, defer to the uh, uh, best judgment of the committee and will be prepared to support whatever the committee decides. I don't know how many other amendments that we've had offered here are going to be incorporated in the Democratic substitute, but it sounds to me as if you have a little influence over the uh, action of this committee, Quees. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Honorable Donald Young from Alaska. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, <clears throat> I always worry when the chairman calls me Donald. Only my mother called me that when she was mad at me, and I hope you're not dear mad at me. Dear friend of mine. Oh, dear friend of mine. All right. <laughs> Used to be a great beard grower, but no longer. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to address a very important matter concerning this bill. As the previous speaker said, I am not sure where we are and what's in all these bills being proposed, including on both sides. But I'm asking for your support for a fair and common sense amendment to the Civil Rights Act that will prevent, prevent an Alaskan company from going under. The firm I refer to is commonly referred to as the Wards Cove Packing Company, which has spent at last 20 years and over $2 million clearing its name in court. Wards Cove has been to court on eight separate occasions. On each of those court appearances, the courts have found that Wards Cove hired individuals based upon their qualifications and not upon their race. Each time, eight times. Simply put, the courts have repeatedly held that Wards Cove did not discriminate. In fact, the firm was even found innocent on the very Griggs standard that the Civil Rights Act seeks to restore. Recently, attorneys for the plaintiff have filed an eighth appeal to this case. Quite frankly, the plaintiff is making an effort to keep the case technically alive and hope that the Civil Rights Act will pass Congress. If the bill passes, it would require that the entire Wards Cove case would start from over using new standards. Mr. Chairman, wholesale relitigation of this case would totally be unfair to a company that has consistently been found innocent in court. It had put this small company out of business. The amendment I am referring to is a very simple and very specific. It will allow the plaintiff in this ninth appearance in court so that the case can be put to rest. However, it will prevent relitigation of this case under the new standards set by H.R. 1. My amendment should not in any way be construed as a general anti-retroactive provision. Far from it. The amendment has been carefully drafted so that it will not affect a host of other cases still pending. 
It is a common sense way to address the effect HR1 will have on the Ward's Coast CAFE. I feel compelled to add that the leadership compromise, to my knowledge, to the Civil Rights Act does not remedy the Ward's Cove problem. I want to repeat that. The plaintiff has filed its eighth appeal, hoping merely to keep the case alive. With the case technically still be under review, it would have to be retried using the new HR1 guidelines. And that's the catch. I hope you see that passing HR1 without this amendment would force this case to be relitigated under laws established 20 years after Ward's Cove was first brought to trial. The amendment is not a sweeping mandate for a weakening provision. Instead, it is a straightforward move for justice which will prevent Ward's Cove from being crushed under the weight of relitigation. Mr. Chairman, I urge you to conclude my amendment under your rule. It's an amendment that makes this bill a lot more uh, palatable for myself. Without it, I find some very strong feelings of opposition to the bill. Thank you very much, Congressman. Mr. Derrick. Thank you. I think you answered my first question. The new version does not take care of Ward's <coughs> Cove, is that correct? But doesn't the new version say H.R. 1 won't apply to orders entered in after June the 1st, 1989, and didn't the district court enter a decision in January of 1991 again finding Ward's Cove innocent? Well, I'm not sure of the dates again, Mr. Derrick. If, if, in fact, I have it on facts that Ward's Cove, just this one case, is not subject to litigation. I'm not privy to the information that you're talking about. I'm based on, on what I've heard that's saying, well, what we call the, I believe, um, uh, the manifest of injustice. Uh, that this way they're, 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 they'll be no longer But the manifest considered. injustice uh, provision would protect Ward's Cove, wouldn't it? No, it, it would, would not. not. Because it's still, under, it's still under revision or review by the appeal. Right. And the secondly it's would be, be because if in fact, um, uh, because it's under repeal, the, the plaintiff could file under the manifest of injustice. And it reopens it. I very frankly, when we first tried to get this amendment adopted, would have liked to say Ward's Cove is not under this HR1, period. There's a sense of justice here. My friends, I mean, everybody, I get calls from this person, this, you've got to support HR1. I'm inclined to support it, but it's impossible for me to support it when you see a company that's been to court over $2 million, this is not a big company, eight times found innocent every time, and the plaintiff is trying to reopen the case, starting all over again. Just the court costs alone are killing this company. It's, and I say it's a small it's company. my understanding the company might have to uh, close up. It will. And that puts my people out of work, and there's absolutely no reason for it. I'm not trying to make this a large uh, retroactive clause. It's just this one small company has always been found innocent. If they were guilty, then they would have been proven guilty many, many, many years ago. And this is the only case that your amendment would have this is the only We've carefully drawn this, this up where it only fits this company. It's set on dates, period. And I don't know the legal reasons why we couldn't just say Ward's Cove, but it's my understanding from everybody involved, they didn't want to do that. Can't do that. No, they can't, can't do it. That's all. Thank you. Yes, Solomon. Thank you. Do everything we can for you, Don. Thank you. Any Thank other you. questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other witnesses wishing to testify? If not, the Rules Committee will be in recess subject to the call of the chair. All members will have one hour notice before we reconvene. Thank you. Thank you. Late in the day on Wednesday, an announcement was made that the Civil Rights Bill will not go to the House floor on Thursday as expected. The Rules Committee will meet again Thursday to continue work on the rule for H.R. 1, the Civil Rights Bill. Coming up shortly, remarks by General Norman Schwarzkopf. C-SPAN 2, created in 1986 as part of the C-SPAN networks, is brought to you as a public service, privately funded by the American cable television industry.